last time on the Switchy YouTube channel. Switchy returned to total trauma after a sudden iceberg related burst in YouTube fame. It was a journey of love and loss as he went all in on the second season, Total Drama Action. He talked about the good and the bad and the things in between. After it all, we learned that Total Drama Action was a worthy successor to the first season of the show, even if it made some questionable decisions with its characterization. I'm looking at you, guitar boy. He also talked a lot about Courtney. It was kind of embarrassing. Like, dude, we know you like her. The whole bit is getting stale, man. Since then, Switchy's YouTube success has reached a whole new level no one could have predicted, especially me. I'm really stumped. I have no idea why people like these videos so much. They're just boring reviews, but whatever. After a barrage of fan requests for a review of the third season, Switchy is making his return to the total drama discussion scene. The fans are definitely excited about that, but is it going to be enough? Will Switchy be able to replicate the same success that took place with the island in action videos, or will he absolutely fail, triggering a total decline from superstardom to absolute irrelevancy? Find out now on the comprehensive roast of Total Drama World Tour! <laughs> How is that? Um, dude, I hate to make this awkward, but I really need to point this out. What's with all this weird hostility? What do you mean? I don't know. That weird tangent about Courtney? Going off about how you don't like my videos? What's your problem? I'm just doing my job. And that entails random petty comments about me during your recap? Uh, yes. Dude, I don't need this. You're the one who wanted me to make this video in the first place. You don't have the right to be such a jerk to me. <laughs> you know what? You know what? Arguing with you is pointless. Let's just start the video. Hey, what's up? Well, it looks like I'm taking this YouTube thing seriously now. I mean, look at me. I bought this. I spent money on it after designing it myself. And look, I have blankets hung up. You know why I'm doing that? It's because it's good for my audio quality. Yeah, I care about that now. I tried it half expecting nothing to happen and was very surprised to find a significant difference. So now I always have to do it. Anyway, here it is, the comprehensive roast of Total Drama World Tour. I wasn't sure if I was gonna do it, but apparently there were a few people who wanted me to make it. Just a few though. I actually didn't notice for a while because there hadn't been much demand. That's obviously a joke. You may or may not have found it funny. Speaking of jokes, one Switchy fan wanted a new Total Drama video so badly that she copied and pasted a whole chainmail scam threat thing and posted it in my Instagram comments. She edited the whole send to five friends or you die part and replaced it with a sentence telling me to make a new Total Drama video instead. Which is definitely taking it far, but I like to see that level of ambition from my switchers. I really want to go all the way with this one. You guys deserve it. But I've already gotten animators and voice actors to help me in this endeavor, and I'm running out of ways to kick things up a notch. It occurred to me that I could introduce a star-studded cast of collaborators to spice things up, but that didn't end up going so well. I tried to get in touch with Saber Spark because he had been musing about Total Drama on Twitter, but I never got any meaningful response. And I was persistent. I even got my fans to speak out about how much they wanted the Switchy Saber Spark collab, but he chose to ignore the wishes of the masses. It's sad. I would have let it end there until he tried to ask his fans for people who could do good Chris McLean impressions for his videos, and he got in contact with Jocato, the Chris McLean impressionist I've been working with for years. He copied my oh, whole fucking shit. flow. That kissed me through the phone. He copied my whole fucking flow. Oh, word for shit. word, bar for bar. <laughs> well, that's fine, Saber Spark. Work with my beloved Jocato all you want. You can take my total drama audience. You can take my collaborators, but you can never take my legacy. Regardless of what you do, I will still be the person who made the Chris McLean roast Franklin meme. I will still be the person who made the Chris McLean and Monokuma sing airplanes meme. And I will still be the person who made the Chris McLean Fortnite meme. You are nothing but a shadow, a mere echo of my creativity. And you will always, always just be a commodified, sanitized imitation of my genius, you piece of shit.
Sorry about the change of scenery, by the way. I'm filming this video here this time because doing it in my bedroom was honestly a hellish experience. It would get so hot, and moving my monitor to place my camera was stressful and obnoxious. If you like the up-close nature of the first two videos, sorry. I don't have much else to say in depth. If you're watching this, I'm assuming you've seen the Island in Action videos and know the drill by now. There's no point in going over things we already know. So, with that being said, the comprehensive roast of Total Drama World Tour. Let's do it. The production for Total Drama World Tour started pretty much right after Total Drama Action was finished. Like, they made it surprisingly fast. The air date of the first episode of Total Drama Action was January 11th, 2009 on Teletoon. Comparatively, the first episode of World Tour aired a mere 17 months later, on June 10th, 2010. By the time Total Drama Action was completely released, the following season was only months away. That's crazy fast. It makes me kind of worried about those new seasons of the show we heard about. It's been over a year. Whatever happened to those? I was surprised by the lack of time between the seasons when I was doing research for this video. I assumed it was a lot longer. From the original broadcast of Total Drama Action's finale to the transition special, American viewers only had to wait four months, which is kind of crazy to me, especially because the special aired in America before it did in the show's home country of Canada. That's actually something that happens for pretty much the entirety of World Tour. Even though World Tour started in Canada with an 11 day head start, it quickly fell behind America. I don't actually know for sure why, I would assume it had to do with how Cartoon Network and Teletoon scheduled things, I think. Something similar happened in Action. Action started airing five months ahead in Canada, but by the time the season finale premiered, the channels were neck and neck. I don't know if Canadians just suck at scheduling television, or if there was something else going on. The Canadian air dates have a lot of weird gaps in general. Like the first two parts of World Tour's premiere were released three months apart. Why would they do that? That's definitely one big thing Americans do better than their northerly neighbor. If you're ever in an argument with a Canadian and they try and dunk on you with their, like, healthcare or whatever, just remind them that in America we know how to schedule a television series properly. They won't come back from that. It's pretty funny though. Total Drama started out as a Canadian production and just aired on Teletoon. But by season 3, Cartoon Network was playing such a huge role in the management of the show that we Americans were getting the products created by Canadians before they were. That's some Banana Republic shit. The four month gap in the release between Action and the special really does surprise me. Because although I was super interested in Action as it was airing, I didn't actually watch World Tour as it first premiered. I just didn't bother. I remember seeing ads for the show advertising the new characters and everything and just not caring enough to keep up. I find myself perplexed by my childhood self because of that. Especially because at the time, I felt like it had been around a year since Total Drama Action ended. The point is, while I was really into Total Drama Island in Action as they were releasing, I was pretty late to the Total Drama World Tour party. But, like Team Fortress 2, I still was the life of it. Although I didn't watch it live, Total Drama World Tour is a super nostalgic season for me. Perhaps even more nostalgic than Islander Action. And the reason is that it was the first season I had ever personally sought out. I watched Island in Action as they premiered, and at that point in my life, I was 7-8 to eight years old. I kept up with the show, but honestly, I rarely processed what was happening. I was a kid, you know? A lot of the things go over your head. The only jokes that I could really follow were the poopy butt fart jokes. The show had plenty of those, but my young, feeble mind had not sufficiently developed to the point where I could observe and ponder the higher level jokes and themes of the show. Cause you know, Total Drama has some pretty big brain content. It's truly a show for the critics. Oops. I was 10 when I first watched World Tour. And at that point, I definitely had a much better sense of what I liked and disliked in media, and there weren't nearly as many jokes and lines that went over my head. I don't remember what caused me to start paying attention to the show again. As I try to excavate the deepest, darkest depths of my memory, I struggle to recall the specific catalyst for my resurgence of interest. I don't remember when Total Drama specifically returned to the forefront of my life, but I have a vague sense of when it happened. If you go to my old YouTube channel and scroll down to the videos I created in early to mid-2012, you can find the Club Penguin videos I made back then, and every single one of them had the main theme of Total Drama in their intros. I actually made a full Club Penguin version of the Total Drama theme song with my and my friends Penguins as the characters. Which, I don't know, looking back now, I think it's kind of adorable. Mom and Dad, I'm doing fine. You guys are on my mind. Yeah, 
asked me what I wanted to be, and now I think the answer is plain to see. I wanna be famous. Funnily enough, if you look in the comment section of the video, you can see a positive comment by the one and only EagleFan246, who, if you don't know, was kind of a big deal in the community. He was like the Steven Spielberg of the Club Penguin YouTube scene. And although YouTube replies from 2012 are broken, you can tell I was starstruck. That wasn't actually the only video of mine that EagleFan246 commented on. There were quite a few of mine that he watched and seemed to like. He and I actually became friends, which meant a lot to me. The reason I'm telling you this is that EagleFan246 would eventually go on to be known as Veilskibum94, a huge animation-focused YouTuber that I'm sure some of you are aware of. Yeah, you know, I'm kind of a big deal. I'm pretty in the know. I actually haven't kept up with him in a long time, but Oscar1, if you're watching this, I wish you the best. I had to have gotten back into Total Drama at some point before July 2012, because that was when I made the Club Penguin version of the show's theme song. Interestingly enough, that's around the same time as when Revenge of the Island was airing, but I think I got back into the show before that, because I remember watching Revenge as it came out. With all of this in mind, I would predict I started getting back into Total Drama from April to June of 2012. I distinctly recall browsing the fandom wiki for the show then, and spoiling the entirety of World Tour for myself without having actually seen it. I don't really know why I did that, but it seemed to be a bad habit at that age. I would extensively browse wikis for games and TV shows I never actually experienced and spoil everything for myself. I was a weird kid. Reading the wiki was actually the catalyst for me finally deciding to watch the show in full. Because as I was doing my research, I came across a few certain plot details surrounding the ending of World Tour that seemed preposterous to me. And then and there, I decided I needed to watch the show to satiate my morbid curiosity. The word morbid might be confusing to those of you who have never seen Total Drama World Tour, but those of you who have know what I'm talking about. Either way, we're going to be covering it in this video. So yeah, I watched through the first 26 episodes for the first time, and I adored it. Total Drama World Tour was the season that made me truly fall in love with this show. After watching it, I entered a huge, totally dramatic phase. My life became Total Drama. My world was Total Drama. I was Total Drama, and Total Drama was me. I rewatched the show multiple times, jammed out to all the songs, and even participated in online camps. Yeah, camps where a bunch of people would all roleplay as Total Drama characters in a YouTube competition. I remember being Duncan in a World Tour competition and making it to fourth place. It was pretty awesome. For at least a couple of years, I actually considered World Tour to be my favorite season of the show. I even preferred it to the OG Island. Yeah, I thought it was that good. Unfortunately for the World Tour fans out there, I did eventually start considering Island my favorite of the bunch, and that's how it's been ever since. But now that I'm making a video on this season, that can very well change. Making these crazy long videos often challenges me to look at the show in new ways from new perspectives, and doing that always shakes my perception up. As I fire up the analysis machine and prepare to watch this season a couple times for this review, I anticipate that happening once again. That leaves the questions. What was it specifically that I loved so much about the show at that age, and how does Total Drama World Tour hold up after all these years? Is it better than I remember? Is it worse? Well, let's find out. After a little bit of housekeeping. Yeah, uh, there are a few things I need to say before the main portion of the review takes place. First of all, if you've seen my reviews of the earlier seasons, you probably remember the visuals of the show being in HD. That's because at some point, Total Drama Island and Total Drama Action were fully remastered into a crisp, gorgeous 1080p experience. And because of that, my video reviews of the show use that crisp, gorgeous 1080p footage, but Total Drama World Tour has never been remastered in that way by Fresh TV. So, if you go from watching Total Drama Action to Total Drama World Tour, there is a dramatic drop in visual quality. And it's kind of a waste of time to be acknowledging this, but because I know someone is going to bring it up, I will bring up the Day of Kids remaster, whatever that is. You might have seen people use footage of World Tour with this logo in the top right section, that's the logo for Day of Kids, which is an Italian children's television channel. The reason many people use this footage, including me in the past, is that it's advertised by a fan YouTube channel that has uploaded the entire show as the third season in HD. But it really isn't. 
All that seems to have been done compared to the standard definition version is that the saturation has been turned up and the footage has been reinterpolated to be 60 frames per second. But all that really means is that there are these obnoxious artifacts of movement in like every frame. So that, along with the annoying watermark, makes me want to use the other version of the footage. And that's what I decided to go with for this review. I know it's not nearly as pleasant to the eyes as the actual HD versions of Island, Action, and Every Other Season, but this is the best I can do. I'm sorry, I wish it was different, but it's not my fault. It's Fresh TV's fault for not properly remastering it. Even on the official Netflix release of World Tour, it's all fuzzy and low detail, so I have little to work with. That's pretty much everything I needed to say in the background knowledge segment. How far are we into this video? Jesus Christ. <laughs> I really am indulgent. However, there still remains one thing that we need to talk about before we can watch World Tour, and that is the Celebrity Manhunt Total Drama Action Reunion Special, an episode that was released as a transition between seasons 2 and 3. So, let's check it out. The Total Drama Action Special is unique among the rest of the episodes of the show, for one primary reason. It's not an episode of Total Drama. Kind of. It's a bit hard to explain. Basically, this episode of Total Drama is in-universe not an episode of Total Drama. It's a TV show called Celebrity Manhunt, which is essentially a celebrity news gossip show. It's similar to networks like TMZ, I think. I don't actually know if that's an accurate comparison, because I know nothing about celebrity news, and I don't know anyone who watches these programs. Sometimes I wonder if they even exist. So yeah, this episode of Total Drama isn't actually an episode of Total Drama, and it is instead an episode of Celebrity Manhunt taking place in an episode of Total Drama. And the episode of Celebrity Manhunt is about Total Drama. Brain hurt yet? I will not be subtle here. I really like this episode. The change of pace and structure does wonders for it, and the fact that it focuses on the lives of the campers outside of the competitions makes it stand out. I really think it's a hilarious way to segue between seasons, and the concept is not wasted at all. The first half of this episode is some of the most fun I have watching Total Drama. It's a rapid fire collection of random gags and bits about the characters' lives since the events of action. The show is hosted by Blamely and Josh, who are given a decent amount of attention throughout the episode. Josh is characterized by his love for catfights, which is stated multiple times. And if you don't know what I mean by catfight, I, I don't mean actual cats. I mean teenage girls. He enjoys seeing teenage girls fight each other. One of my favorite bits is the one where Beth and Lindsay apparently got arrested in Paris after they accidentally vandalized the Mona Lisa, if only because the French guard literally just says omelette du fromage when he sees it happen. It's a really cute reference to the famous Dexter's Lab episode. Our homeschooled hoser turned homie, Ezekiel, went back to the farm for some downtime. Celebrity Manhunt caught up with him. Yo, 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 paparazzi peeps. Yo, want a piece of the Zeke's? Sup? The reason the episode is taking place in-universe is that the Jemmy Awards, presumably a fictional portmanteau of Emmy and Gemini, is happening and the Total Drama cast has been nominated as the best reality TV ensemble, so everyone is slated to show up on the red carpet. However, Chris doesn't seem to expect the cast to win the award. Also, apparently, Justin, Cody, Trent, and Harold formed a boy band called the Drama Brothers. What? When I cry, my eyes wet. I swear it wasn't guy sweat. It's Celebrity Manhunt's Total Drama Red Carpet Reunion Special. Now let's look at what happens when the loving stops on Total Drama Breakups. Uh, breakups? Apparently. Duncan and Courtney have broken up. Again. Something about an argument at a restaurant going a bit far. And they're having a legal custody battle for their pet raccoon. At least that last detail is pretty funny. One thing I like about this episode is how they keep hinting at Sierra's appearance before she is formally introduced. You can see her all over the place in the first half of the episode, which I think is cute. What isn't cute is the picture of the Drama Brothers skinny dipping. Like, what the hell? Why is Justin doing a Super Mario jump? The Drama Brothers arc of this episode is pretty funny though. I especially like the part where Josh goes to the studio with the guys and observes all the rising tension between them. 
Harold is even considering leaving the band. That was my last performance as a flavor boy. I'm gonna go solo. Check it. What does low so mean? Solo? One small nitpick I have is that the show isn't totally sure if they want to portray the Drama Brothers as successful or not. In one moment, they're being stalked and obsessed over, but in the next, they can't sell a single album on the day of its debut. I know it's said that the band was declining in popularity, but it's never really established why and to what extent. I think my favorite celebrity manhunt bit throughout this entire episode is either Heather and Gwen's internet fight or Izzy's career as an actress. If I was forced to choose between the two though, it would probably be Izzy. The pop culture references are fun, but what really ties it together for me is the overt parody of the infamous freakout by Christian Bale on the set of Terminator Salvation. Like, some parts are word for word. Or I'll kick your butt! I want you off the set! Kick your fucking ass! I want you off the fucking set, you prick! Sorry. No! <laughs> don't be sorry! Think for a second! No, don't just be sorry. Think for one fucking second. One other bit before the second half of the episode starts is the part about Tyler and Lashana starring in a bunch of reality TV shows together. For some reason. Yeah, you know, Tyler and Lashana. The bestest of best friends. They're inseparable, really. Like two peas in a pod. After musing about Eva's long history of video freakouts, the episode quits the whole Easter egg thing and formally introduces Sierra. Well, kind of. She's technically introduced as an anonymous fan who runs a website dedicated to Eva. Would you call yourself a gossip-crazed Eva fan? It's not just Eva. I have websites for everyone from Total Drama. Wow, I'm in the presence of gossip royalty. Well, Blainly, Sierra might have a bunch of websites, but has she ever made three several-hour-long reviews of the show? No? Well then, I think it's time we acknowledge the real Total Drama superfan in the room. That's why it's important to keep my identity a total secret. There you are, silly beans! <sighs> so much for my anonymity. I kind of find it hilarious that in this scene, Izzy just shows up with no explanation. She apparently just followed Sierra into a presumably locked building and confronted her live on set. You'd think there would be security or something. Yeah, I mean, I like this episode, but a lot of things just happen for seemingly no reason. Like, Sierra's suddenly sent to the red carpet out of nowhere as a reporter. You'd think they'd have a dedicated person for that. Anyway, following the commercial break, the episode shifts to a live broadcast of the red carpet at the Gemmy Awards, with Sierra repeatedly trying and failing to get interviews with members of the Total Drama cast. Nothing super of note really happens other than everyone showing up at the entrance to the building, though we do have a few funny gags. Everyone shows up at the door and Chef doesn't let them in because they're not famous. I don't know why Chef is working as the doorman and has the authority to not let people in, but okay then. Apparently it's Chris's call, but that only confuses me further. It was my understanding that the Gemmy Awards were a separate entity from Total Drama. Anyway, after it is revealed that Noah has been working as Chris McLean's assistant, a limo occupied by the pizza guy slash cameraman, the Sasquatch, the escaped psycho killer with a chainsaw and a hook, a bear, and the Eskimo from the Hot Campshire episode all show up. You might also know them as whatever leftover rigs the animators had in their miscellaneous folder. Apparently, they're the cast of the new show Chris is working on, Total Drama Dirtbags. He says that the Total Drama cast is on the decline and that he doesn't need them anymore, and abandons them on the outside of the award show building that suddenly became empty out of nowhere. The campers spend a few minutes trying to think of a way to get in, and we get a really fun little montage of Izzy shenanigans, but it doesn't really amount to much. Much to their dismay, the cast of Total Drama doesn't win the Jemmy for Best Reality Ensemble, and when Chris wins Best Reality TV Show Host, he doesn't even acknowledge their contributions. Asshole. Chris announces that the following day, he will announce the details of his new series on The Orpa Show. You know, The Orpa Show. Personally, I always preferred The Lelin Show. Actually, what's really funny about The Orpa line is that Oprah Winfrey's birth name literally is Orpa Winfrey. She was named after the figure from the Hebrew Bible. Her name was eventually changed to Oprah, but now I wonder if the people who wrote this episode swapped the P and the R on a whim, or they were actually making some 4D chess reference to the actual Oprah Winfrey's personal life. After a pep talk from Sierra, the entire cast devises a plan to climb their way back to fame by crashing Chris McLean's Orpah interview. 
so they all go into DJ's bus to drive to New York and crash the event. After the commercial break, we find ourselves ditching the whole celebrity gossip formula and following the campers driving through the desert as they make their way to New York. That kind of confuses me though, given that I would have guessed that Jemmy Awards were done in Toronto, and there's no desert in between those two cities, but maybe they were in Vancouver or something? But if they were in Vancouver, then trying to drive all the way to New York City in less than 24 hours is futile, especially in a bulky, non-aerodynamic vehicle like a bus. Come on, Total Drama writers, is it really that hard to maintain some basic geographic accuracy? <laughs> the Total Drama OG bus catches up with the Dirtbag bus, and they use a makeshift slingshot out of chocolate snacks in Lashana's bra to engage in combat. It goes well at first, but the buses are still up close and personal. Hurry it up! Back off! It won't go any faster than this! What we need is a man behind the wheel. What you need is some tape over your mouth. Well, if you just listen to me... Oh, I'll start listening the minute you say something worthwhile! You're insane, you know that? And you are a monster! Whoa! That's what we've been waiting for, ladies and gentlemen. You can never stop the inevitable. And dump me is inevitable. They're gonna last forever. Nothing will ever break them up. Courtney and Duncan's passionate reunion is nice, but it sadly leads to the bus going off road and falling into a ravine. Luckily, Lashana's bra gets stuck and offers them a safe landing. However, they still are trapped, and anyone here who plays Minecraft will know how annoying ravines are to explore. Jeff goes off to find help, and is followed by Trent, Justin, Katie, Sadie, Beth, and Eva. Bad move, bro. Bad move. We get like two minutes of random gags, but right after, the entire cast is saved by Chris and taken back to the film lot. Chris tells them that Total Drama Dirtbags was just a test to see how the kids would act in the face of opposition, and as a reward for pulling the stunt they did, they all get invited into a whole new season of Total Drama. It turns out that the bunch of randos Chris hired as the new cast were all a fluke, and the Total Drama Dirtbag cast was never meant to be in an actual show. Except Alejandro, he's special, for whatever reason. Sierra gets signed on as well, but it's never explained why. There's never really any acknowledgement of it, but she just gets added, I guess because she was on the bus with everyone. I don't actually know. Sadly, Jeff and his squad are not invited back for the next season, and Eva is very unhappy about that. Well, I'm certainly glad that whole dirtbags thing was just a trick. Could you imagine if Total Drama actually replaced its own cast? How stupid of an idea would that be? Like, seriously. The episode closes out with a bunch of confessionals that set up some of the attitudes our campers are having as they approach the new season. Watch out, Total Drama nerds. The new guy is going all the way to the top. Whoa, so there's our season antagonist. I would talk more in depth about each individual character's confessional, but basically everyone here is totally dwarfed by Sierra's kick-ass intro, where she just goes on and on about random crap until the camera's battery goes out. Talking to all my favorite TV stars is so fab. Now I will finally put to rest all those Cody Block questions, like how many freckles does he have on his back? What kind of deodorant does he use? How many times does Cody sleep facing west? And what song does he sing in the shower? Ooh, ooh, oh my. That last question will definitely be a six month analysis. Oh yeah. Yeah, uh, spoiler alert for this review. I really like Sierra and I will probably make that very, very obvious as things go on. The episode finally closes out with Chris McClain name dropping the new season. Total Drama Musical. Well, that's what he says. The text is Total Drama World Tour. This is actually because Total Drama World Tour was originally going to be titled Total Drama The Musical, but they eventually changed it to World Tour. However, I guess they already had recorded the lines and didn't feel it necessary to change. So yeah, I love this episode. I mean, it's really not hard to at least remember this episode for its unique premise, but it really goes above and beyond with it. Like the Island special, it gives basically every character in the show some meaningful screen time, and that's something I really appreciate. Total Drama has a lot of characters and a lot of them go unappreciated by the writers, but episodes like this make up for it. It certainly helps that all the celebrity news bits really are super funny. There were so many scenes that I wanted to comment on, but for the sake of time, I had to control myself. It's just that fun. So yeah, it's a great stepping stone between seasons. 
but how good is the season we're moving towards anyway? Well, let's find out. Season three of Total Drama, folks! The world is gonna be mine! Sea to shining sea! The first episode starts out refreshingly simple. Campers in a bus at a new site. All the contestants come out pretty smoothly, with a couple of exceptions. Sweet strawberry preserves! No! He's afraid of flying, remember? I'm actually surprised that the writers remembered that. I've poked fun at the show for its lack of internal consistency before, so it's kind of interesting that they remembered Owen's biggest fear. That seems like the kind of thing they'd forget about. I guess the reason they remembered is that there's a lot of comedic material that can be drawn from a character like Owen being afraid of flying. Aerophobia, from the Latin, as opposed to aeronausophobia, the fear of air sickness. Keep up the fascinating facts, and I'm going to be aeronauseous all over you. It is nice to have you back, Noah. Funnily enough, Izzy doesn't seem to be afraid of flying anymore. But given that it's Izzy, I don't really think her fear of flying was ever a real thing. Alejandro is introduced, and the show makes it very clear very early that he is a very skilled charmer. He's kind of like Justin, except not as insanely attractive. But he trades that extreme level of physical attractiveness for intelligence. In a nutshell, he's Justin, but not stupid. Chris then introduces Sierra. And she's a sugar-addicted superfan with 16 total drama blogs. But wait, didn't Sierra say she has a blog for every single contestant? There's 22 contestants. You need to do more research, Chris. Anyway, Sierra starts having her obsessive freakout, and normally I'd be totally fine with this, but I have to admit that I'm a little bit frustrated. And the reason I'm frustrated is that she's acting like she is seeing all these people for the first time, when that's not true. Not even counting the time she's probably stalked some of them, she directly interacted with the whole cast in the special, where she was surprisingly cool-headed. She was certainly presented as a dedicated fan of the show, but she seemed to be a lot more in control of her emotions. Literally right after she comes out of the bus, she goes up to Cody and says she's dreamt of the moment she would meet him. But she already has. She spent a 12-hour bus ride with him. I actually don't know for sure why this discrepancy exists, but I have two theories. My first one is that they wanted to write the first episode of World Tour as if Sierra was being introduced for the first time because they assumed some people wouldn't have seen the special. My second one, the one I think is more likely, is that the special was written a significant time before or after the first episode of World Tour was written, and the two episodes weren't really checked side by side at any point because of that. After a bit of physical comedy and slapstick, we are first shown the new theme song sequence for the show. And damn, it's a pretty good one. It's not quite as faithful to the original one as Action was, but it still re-implements common beats in a unique way, like Owen being underwater. I don't know how it would stack up against the other sequences, mostly because I've never directly compared them all, but I certainly do like it. Speaking of music, the episode immediately transitions to exposition about the musical aspect of the show as the campers explore the plane. In every episode, the campers will be forced to sing a song. They have to make up lyrics as they go, and they are not being given any formal training or guidance. They just have to wing it. Some campers don't like the idea of singing, but Courtney is pretty enthusiastic. This is the dining area where you'll enjoy in-flight meals. Not for long, eh? Prepare to lose to the Zeke. Okay, so not trying to be mean here, but you do know you got voted out first last time, right? <laughs> Chris shows the group the economy in first-class cabins. The economy class is for the losing team after each challenge, and the first class cabin is for the winning teams. While touring the first class area, Alejandro starts flirting with Lindsay, right in front of Tyler, her boyfriend. But it appears that Lindsay doesn't even remember who Tyler is. I don't really know why. She's dumb, I guess. Oh my gosh. Poor... Uh, I'm blanking on his name. Oh, oh, I know. Alejandro. That's my name. And what a nice name. Alejandro, I could say it all day. Please do. <laughs> Heather starts observing the behavior of Alejandro at this point and theorizes that he is not who he seems. She does a whole spiel about it in the cockpit confessional while showing off her new ponytail that I haven't directly mentioned until now. Anyway, with Beth gone, Lindsay and LA whatever looking like a real threat, my only strategic option is to make friends with the new girl. But pretending to like that is gonna be hard. I do not heart the new girl. I heart the new girl. 
There's something about the 2010's depiction of a crazy obsessed superfan that eternally entertains me. As the plane lifts off, Chris gets so annoyed by Ezekiel that he throws him out as an executive elimination. But unbeknownst to the cast, Ezekiel is able to catch up with the aircraft and makes his way back. I know a lot of people don't care for Ezekiel, but that is pretty impressive. As the plane approaches Europe, Chris approaches the cast, alerting them it is now time for their first musical number. And given that this whole number is canonically made up as it goes, it's surprisingly well synchronized. Well, now I am confronted with the dilemma of how to approach these musical numbers. Because, well, they're a defining aspect of the season. Total Drama World Tour without its musical numbers is like a burger without fries. Or maybe not. I think there's a lot to Total Drama World Tour. It's more like a burger and fries, but no drink. Or something. For how I should review the songs in this video, I've decided to not go too in-depth. My plan is to just talk about things that specifically stand out to me from each song without dwelling on the details. I'm also not going to be overly critical or analytical of the music either. If you're hoping for me to break out the Switch the Knee Switch channel and start aggressively analyzing stuff like the lyricism and cultural accuracy of these songs, you're gonna be disappointed. I just don't feel like the music here deserves serious scrutiny. I think some people might be quick to call it bad or cheap or annoying or whatever, but I think that giving it at that level of attention is being more focused on the music than you need to be. And this is coming from the guy who complained about Sierra's inconsistent portrayal a few minutes ago. Basically, the opinion I have of the music in this season is that it's just a fun novelty. If I sat down here and put on airs about the lyrics of Baby being a bit cheesy, or the instrumental of We Are Shearing Sheep being kind of generic as if it was a serious problem that should have been fixed, that would honestly be really disingenuous. It's just cute comedy music. If you want me to be a hard ass about that kind of stuff, just follow my Rate Your Music account. I can't 100% confirm this claim, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that Fresh TV didn't quite have the budget to meticulously create diverse, culturally faithful bangers in the vein of shows like the Backyardigans. They weren't hiring professional dancers and musicians to properly replicate bossa nova or Argentinian tango. I can tell you that much. But for what this show offers, it's pretty fun. It's not like I put most of these songs on repeat, but I think the vast majority are perfectly fine. At worst, it's a mildly annoying detour. At best, it's a really awesome and memorable sequence. Anyway, that's my whole spiel about the music of Total Drama and how I want to approach it. I hope it wasn't too loaded. The first song of the show, if you don't count the opening theme, is Come Fly With Us, and it's one hell of an intro. It's triumphant and full of energy. It does a great job of establishing the plane as the setting of the episode and season, and there are a good amount of funny lines. There's something about Noah's delivery of, Come fly with us, come die with us, that never really gets old to me. Anyway, everyone in the cast is willing to sing, except for Duncan and Gwen. And... Owen, technically. He starts screaming and got knocked out by Chris. Duncan and Gwen refuse to sing until Chris lets them know that quote unquote, all contestants must sing in each show, or face elimination. And after a bit of resistance, the two of them give in and decide to sing. It ends with a nice shot where Gwen appears to be floating in midair. Wow, every camper has to sing in each episode? That's intense. I'm sure it'll be fun for us to watch every camper sing in each episode like they're supposed to and the rules that will definitely be followed. The plane lands in Egypt, where the campers have their first challenge, making it to the other side of a pyramid by going over or under it. Under the pyramid is a long, difficult maze, and above it is a steep climb and descent. Also, Ezekiel comes back and is allowed into the game. And since we're in Egypt, you know I had to. I don't feel good doing this, but I knew I kind of had to do it when it occurred to me that I could. Rock climbing was the team building challenge when I was a CIT, and if Tiffany Prizlebuski hadn't been such a lousy partner, I'd have won. I always said Tiffy was overrated. <laughs> I have no idea why, but that line is so funny to me. I love these two. The challenge is pretty typical total drama challenge fare. Some laughs, some slapstick, etc. I'm not complaining though. I'm just glad to finally have a quick break here. The script for this episode's review is already absurdly long. From making three of these massive reviews, I've learned that the first one is always one of the most difficult to do. There's so much to cover, and this time is not an exception. I should mention though, that there is a scene where DJ finds a mummified dog and tries to pet it. For some reason, he seems to think it's a real living dog when it's obviously not. When he pets it, the dog cracks and disintegrates. It sets off a trap and also triggers what can only be described as a curse. Ooh. Chris divides the campers into this season's three teams based on the order they arrive at the finish line. Well, for the most part. 
There are a couple of times where he does it differently. Just as Duncan, Gwen, and Courtney make it to the top, Chris tells them that they have to sing a reprise of Come Fly With Us, and that sets Duncan off. He loses it, yells at Chris, and quits the game. Because, after all, you have to sing or be eliminated. That's a rule in the season that every camper has to follow. I can see why Duncan was so willing to quit, though. He is a millionaire, after all. Well, if he won action in your region, he is. If not, he's still broke. Kind of a Schrodinger's cat-like situation. After some deliberation, the teams pick their names. Team Victory! Team Amazon! Team number one and and number two. Got it! Team Chris is really, 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 really hot! What? The teams get the rewards for the next challenge, which seem a bit uneven at first, but Chris insists that they all have their own advantages and disadvantages. After that, the first episode of the season draws to a close. Episode 2 starts right where episode 1 left off. The campers do some socializing as they wait for Chris to explain the rules of the next part of the challenge. Sierra starts chatting with Izzy and they bond over the men they love. Did you know Cody slept with a stuffed emu named Jerry until he was... Well, okay, he still does. And you know this how? I called his aunt once. I pretended I was a telemarketer. Ooh, stalkerlicious. Sometimes it's really mind-boggling how the creators of this show booted Noah out in the fourth episode of Total Drama Island and then didn't bring him back for action given how funny he is and how much fun they seem to have writing him. They really kept that ace up their sleeve. After some chit-chat, Chris shows up and our three teams are tasked with crossing the Sahara until they find the Nile River. The members of Team Victory express frustration at how they won the first challenge, but their reward was just a stick. Conversely, the losing team, Amazon, got a camel. But once again, Chris insists that all the rewards have their benefits. And he's actually right. Because later on in the episode, the stick is revealed to be a divining rod. Move it, people! It's a race! Uh, hello? It's Team Amazon, not Dictatorship Amazon. Great. Well, I'll stop being bossy when you start doing things right. Whee! Yeah, I get the throat! Hi, Craig! Hi, Craig! I just introduced myself and Camelie. Courtney, Heather, Gwen, and Izzy all on the same side? Talk about a star-studded alliance. It's like the audio slave of Total Drama teams. Team Chris is really, 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 really hot, is left with a small goat as their reward. And although it seems useless at first, Alejandro gets everybody on the goat in perfect balance with an organized pose. It's basic weight distribution. Anyone with a degree in engineering or an IQ of 163 or higher could figure it out. Oh, shut up, you little smartass. Mr. I have an IQ of 163. No one cares. You know, Dr. Eggman from the Sonic games has an IQ of 300, but you don't see him bragging about it like you do. Team Victory fiddles with their stick at first, and DJ throws it in the sky and accidentally hits a seagull in the air. He hits it bad too. This is what kickstarts his theory that he has a curse. Right before Chris sends the cast off to explore the desert, he unloads a bunch of hostile scarab beetles and heat on them, because of course he does. The scarabs overwhelm the cast and even start crawling on one of the interns, and when we next see him, all that remains is a skeleton, because the scarabs ate him. He died. This transitions into this episode's music challenge. The cast has to sing a soothing love song to calm the scarabs, and this is a pretty good one. Loving time is definitely more relaxing than the bombastic Come Fly With Us, and the soothing melodic vocals here are actually pretty good. I have to give a shout out to a lot of the voice actors and actresses here, especially the ones who have to put on the silly voices, because maintaining the cartoon voices while singing is not easy. I especially like the hook and refrain here. In the scarabs, despite apparently being flesh-eating monsters, are actually pretty cute. The cast almost sneaks away, but Ezekiel sings off key or something and pisses all the scarabs off again, because Ezekiel sucks at everything, except for stowing away on airplanes. He seems to be pretty good at that. After a few minutes, Team Chris is the first to make it to the river, and the first to start the next challenge, creating a boat out of river reeds and crossing the Nile with the reward they have. Luckily for Team Chris, Sierra is a fourth generation basket weaver, whatever that means. I guess her mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother are all basket weavers, too. I don't know. Sierra starts making insane progress on her team's boat, and not too long after, the Amazons make it to the river. Sierra takes the opportunity to talk to Izzy, and the two express a desire to be on each other's teams, because Sierra wants to be with Cody and Izzy wants to be with Owen. Maybe we could swap teams! 
trade a basket case for a basket weaver? Fine, Sierra, you're with us. <laughs> what the hell? Heather's been on fire this episode. More on fire than usual. Sierra butters up Chris and he decides to let the team swap happen. And thus, my favorite team in all of Total Drama is formed. And honestly, it's not even close. Ta da! Team Amazon Ross! So not clear! Cool. Don't give up, we still have a shot! Al's right! Thanks, Al. <laughs> I have no problem being called Al. <laughs> I don't think he likes being called Al. All three teams face difficulties making their boats, but more or less begin crossing the Nile at the same time. Right as they all set sail, Chris challenges them all to a musical reprise, and they sing It's Rowing Time, which is basically It's Loving Time with a faster tempo. Oh, and a parental advisory warning. Mm -hmm. Crocodile amigos, what you swam for? We don't mean to fuck you. Language! This is a children's show! We don't mean to bug you! She's obviously trying to say bug, but that is not what I think most people hear. Team Amazon make it to the finish line first, followed by Team Chris and then, ironically, Team Victory. Chris states, though, that as long as every team arrived with their award, there won't be an elimination for this challenge. Unfortunately for Team Victory, Ezekiel accidentally lost the Divining Rod while they were trying to cross the river, so Victory now has to vote somebody off. The team is obviously going to blame Zeke, but honestly, the entire group is at fault. Leaving Ezekiel, the guy who unequivocally sucks at everything except for climbing landing gear, in charge of the stick was a failure of the collective. So, we transition to the voting process, which is done much more transparently in this season. You never really knew who voted for whom in Season 1, but in this season, you'll get used to seeing the votes being cast in action, which is pretty cool. Lindsay votes for everyone, Lashana votes for Ezekiel, Harold votes for Ezekiel, Bridget votes for Ezekiel, DJ's vote is not shown, and Ezekiel votes for DJ. And this is a scene that became very notable to me last year when I created the Total Drama Iceberg. In that video, I had to explain the topic of Ezekiel being racist. And at that point, I personally discarded it as just a joke theory being put down because of his comments about women and how he's a stereotype of a typical sheltered rule light. What I didn't bring up was the scene here of Ezekiel voting for DJ, and I was told by a couple of people that the iceberg topic was actually referring to this scene. It wasn't that many people though, just a couple. But yeah, I mean, it's still not a super serious theory, and I think there are plenty of explanations for Zeke voting for DJ other than him being prejudiced against other races. But that's the basis that I missed out on. You're a fraud! You don't know shit about Total Drama! Shut up. So, the episode closes off with Ezekiel being pushed off the plane and Duncan being forced to jump right after. But we quickly learn that Ezekiel is really determined and not quite ready to leave as he holds onto the plane's... Uh... Uh... Give me a second. Horizontal Stabilizer. Yeah, the plane's Horizontal Stabilizer. Losing Sierra to Heather? Meh, tragic. But I still have the upper hand. The president of Cody's fan club doesn't know a thing about me. No one does. And I intend to keep it that way. Because compared to me, Heather's a saint. <laughs> Jesus, Alejandro. That's some chaotic evil level monologuing. <laughs> wow. Episode 3 opens up as the plane nears its next destination, and this is a good one. And I hope you all brought your giant radioactive monster repellent because we are about to land in Japan! Gosh, you guys, that's totally a Chinese outfit. Thank you, Harold. Now remember, anyone who doesn't sing... You just, you'd really think you'd work harder to get it right. Harold! Anyone who doesn't sing is immediately disqualified. Your cultural insensitivity is just... Gosh! You lost me at cultural insensitivity, Harold. Instead of landing the plane, Chef decides to just slice open one of the doors and all the players get sucked out of the plane and start falling to their deaths. I don't know why Chris is able to stand properly with a door gone in one shot and not able to in another. Anyway, as the campers are falling, they're given the musical challenge for this episode. And this song, Before We Die, is pretty good. Not only are there several funny lines, all the imagery of the cast falling down is well done. Especially Harold and Owen breaking the laws of physics by falling in the wrong directions. And double especially for the circle shot. That's a pretty good shot. I have to say though, I'm legitimately surprised that they did this song in the Japan episode. 
It has nothing to do with Japanese culture, and that's not necessarily a deal breaker, but I would have guessed they would do a song that parodies anime or some other element of Japanese culture in this episode. The group conveniently falls into a giant bowl of rice, and Alejandro flirts with Lashana right in front of Harold. He even speaks Japanese to her, because of course he can speak Japanese. He's Alejandro. The first part of the challenge is a crazy pinball machine game show parody thing, and in this scene, we learn that Tyler apparently really likes Japanese game shows. For some reason, I really like that detail. In the challenge, one member of each team has to get in these giant pinballs and try to score the most points. They also have to be accompanied by a panda. Gosh, you guys, pandas don't even appear naturally in Japan. They're only native to China. You just, you'd really think you'd work harder to get things right. Alejandro volunteers to do it for Team Chris. Cody volunteers for Team Amazon and Lashana forces DJ to do it on Team Victory. It's never explained why she wanted it. I guess the writers just want to see DJ's animal curse in action. Team Victory's panda obviously hates and assaults DJ. Conversely, Alejandro's panda adores him, because it's Alejandro. And Cody? Well, his panda is Sierra. Oh, to be physically assaulted by an obsessive fan that I'm terrified of. He really is living the dream. If we got a point for every time she kissed me in there, we'd be millionaires. Is this her gum? <laughs> yeah, living the dream. Team Chris wins the first part, followed by Team Victory and then Team Amazon. Of course, the Victory Panda does not fare too well after being in the pinball with DJ. After the break and a funny bit involving total drama in Japan, the second part of the challenge is announced, making a Japanese commercial. Because, you know, those truly are the two pillars of Japanese culture. Silly game shows and weird commercials. Jokes aside, I do actually find this challenge pretty cool. It's enjoyable seeing the teams work with the resources they have to make their ads, especially Team Victory. Primarily because of Harold, who, after being buttered up and manipulated by Alejandro, takes total control of the production. But like most visionaries of the world, his ambition comes at the cost of the friendship with his teammates. I have a dramatic vision. It mixes Kurosawa's pathos with Miyazaki's sense of wonder. Man, I love Harold. He really is the sleeper hero of Total Drama. Team Amazon is the last team able to look for props in the cargo hold, and because of that, they don't have much to work with. Unless you count seeing a shadowy figure resembling Ezekiel to be something to work with. The three alpha girls all storm off and we're left with just Cody and Sierra, who just throw something together on their own. The scene where all the commercials are shown is actually really cool. Team Chris makes a kaiju-inspired commercial featuring Owen as the monster. Team Amazon uses the random junk they have to make a crazy, surreal explosion of colors. But my personal favorite is Team Victories, primarily because I find the whole nerdy teenager's recreation of artsy Japanese cinema concept hilarious. It's made even funnier when literally everyone hates it and they lose. Before the vote, Alejandro once again plays to Harold's insecurities by convincing him to make a noble sacrifice. And because of that, Harold is the one who goes home, despite DJ being the one who got the most votes. He interrupts the vote and commits seppuku, but not the badass real kind. He just uses a lightsaber projection thing, like a little wuss. Though, right after he dives off the plane without a parachute, so maybe he's not a wuss. I don't know. I suppose it depends on your school of thought on the definition of wussiness. But hey man, he had a good run. <laughs> and that Kurosawa Miyazaki line is still very funny to me. Episode 4 takes our cast to the Yukon, where they have the challenge of navigating a partially frozen river then doing a sled dog routine on a select route to the finish line. The first camper of any team who arrives has to be a sled, which is sort of a double-edged sword kind of rule. It makes it so that individual members don't want to be the first person there, but if everyone on a team refuses to finish the course, the entire team is worse off. So there's a bit of bickering here and there. Courtney, first game is on to arrive. Grab a sled and start pulling. Heather got here at the exact same time. We should both pull the sled. Yeah, no. In the event of a tie, we go alphabetically. Heather, help me out here. What can I do, Courtney? I didn't make the alphabet. Putting these two on the same team really was such a great idea. The first half of the challenge is primarily used for comedic purposes, especially with characters like Owen and Sierra. There's a scene where Cody's about to get attacked by a polar bear, but Sierra manages to completely knock it out by throwing a giant ice cube at it. Then Cody falls into the water, and Sierra quickly rows her way to save him. I don't know about you guys, but I am a really huge fan of Sierra's brand of physical comedy. 
I just adore seeing the absurdity of her abilities that are essentially just justified by the power of love or whatever. Oh, dear Cody, if one of us drowns, I want it to be me. Me too. We do get some establishing character drama throughout the sequence, though. Alejandro starts turning his flirtatious charm towards Bridget, and he actually seems to be really throwing her off her game. When Jeff's around, I'm never tempted by other guys. Probably because when Jeff's around, we're always making out, but now that it's just me, I miss Jeff? He even quote-unquote accidentally kisses her, which certainly freaks her out. I kind of, I have a kind of, a boyfriend, kind of. I wonder how Jeff is doing right now. Poor guy is probably devastated. Meanwhile, Lindsay still doesn't remember who Tyler is and actually calls him Noah by accident because she's really just that stupid. Team Victory quickly takes the lead in the second half of the challenge, but much of their dismay, things turn against them. DJ cries so much that he freezes his own eyes shut, and his streak of bad luck with animals continues when he accidentally crashes into a baby seal. However, the team's fate is sealed, no pun intended, when Alejandro convinces Bridget to kiss him, and at the last second, he shoves a pole in her face, which, without sounding too spiteful, serves her right. Chris forces Bridget to sing a song about it and gets Team Amazon to do backup. And this song, stuck to a pole, is all right. It's nothing particularly special sonically, and the fact that Bridget can't speak properly makes it sound kind of silly. Her voice is so indiscernible that they had to add captions so you could understand what she was saying. But for what it's worth, the lyricism is actually better than usual for the show. Bridget's first verse is especially well written. But I kind of noticed that Cody didn't sing, which is against the rules, though for whatever reason, he seems to be allowed to stay in the game. Anyway, Bridget never makes it to the finish line, and Team Victory for the third time in a row loses and has to vote someone off. How ironic. And for the whole pole kissing thing, Bridget is the one who has to take the drop of shame. She tries to warn the rest of the team about Alejandro's evil schemes, but sadly, they don't understand her. New York is the next destination of our cast, but before the plane lands, we get some dialogue between the teams. What is that horrible smell? Defeat? I could have pulled the sled faster if someone wasn't whipping me. We both know that's not true. Oh, first chance we get, I'll totally help you vote her off. Gladly. Can we whip her off? Whip me off? Ha! Huh. Not if I can prove my worth to the team. Or manipulate Sierra and Cody into slavishly obeying me. Whatever works. Hey, buddies. Have I said enough how much I value your friendship? You've only spoken to me like three times ever, including this one. Ladies, are you almost finished with your tea party? It's the sound of girls all over the world running and rushing just desperate to lock their doors. <laughs> hey, buddies. Have I said enough how much I value your friendship? Wow. He was right. Three times ever, including this one. Anyway, a big portion of this episode is dedicated to the villain war that takes place between Heather and Alejandro as they fight for control of the game. And the major piece being fought over in this reality show chess game is Sierra. But Sierra isn't quite as easily manipulated as they think she is. Of course I know Heather's playing me. I've seen every episode like 15 times, hello? I'm playing Heather. Alejandro notes that Sierra is a valuable teammate because of her being Chris's favorite, and devises a plan to sabotage her good favor with him. How, you ask? Well, he tells her to remind him of the good old days. Hey Chris, know what? I own every one of your TV appearances on DVD, even your cooking show. Keep it plain with Chris McLean. It's totally unfair you got canceled after only one episode. <laughs> Making those terrible movies about talking cats? Uh... <laughs> Man, I really feel for Chris here. Having one's past entertainment blunders put on show like that can really sting. Hey, Switchy! Remember that time you made that Super Smash Bros video that got over 10,000 views, but you had to delete it because it was getting so many negative comments and dislikes? Uh, uh... Or how about that time you tried making the bad subreddit series, but it got so few views and such mixed reception that you deleted it out of shame? Um, well... Or how about that time you tried to be an Overwatch YouTuber talking about the game's meta back in 2017? Shut up! Shut the fuck up! I swear to God, just shut up! 
The challenge this time around is split into three parts. Well, three or four, depending on your definition. The first part is climbing up the Statue of Liberty to get a baby carriage, and the second part is racing that carriage across Central Park. There's a really funny scene in the first part where Cody, Tyler, and Noah come across the Statue of Liberty's, um, um, uh, mammary glands, and Cody gets distracted and accidentally falls into them. He begins sinking in, but luckily Sierra quickly saves him. With her teeth, too. For a second, I actually thought I was gonna die in there. But what a way to go. <laughs> True that! <laughs> What's interesting about this scene is that it was banned from a lot of broadcasts of the show for two very large reasons. So if you're confused why you don't remember it, that's probably the reason. The song of this episode takes place during the second half of the challenge, and it has all our campers getting into that whole New York state of mind. What's not to love about New York City? The taxis honk out of New York City, the crime is high. Well, that's one thing not to like about New York City. I don't see how high crime is a good thing. Also, once again, Cody doesn't actually sing. What the hell? That's two times he hasn't bothered to sing in a challenge. He can't keep getting away with this! Anyway, in the third part of the challenge, the campers have to bob for giant apples in a pond and take it to the finish line. Of course, there are a bunch of angry snapping turtles, and also, of course, DJ kills one of them. Team Chris is the first to retrieve their apple and reach the finish line, but they don't end up winning the challenge. While they weren't looking, Heather swapped their card out with, get this, a random stranger's baby carriage. Like, I'm pretty sure that's straight up child abduction. They do eventually swap the cards back, but they still get last place, with Victory in second and Amazon in first. Luckily for them, though, this challenge is a reward challenge, and no one has to go home. I was even going to call my first fan club the Christians, but that name was already taken. Our next episode is our first total drama aftermath, and this season, things are a little bit different. Because Bridget was cast as a competitor, she needed someone to replace her as a co-host. So whom did the producer pick? Well, none other than Blainly, one of the characters we saw on Celebrity Manhunt. Give it up, everyone! Oh, nobody cares. Blainly is really big on this whole celebrity drama thing, and she loves to stir the pot when it comes to bitter feelings between people. I mean, she starts right off trying to turn the peanut gallery against Jeff for doing the whole rescue party thing. And once that's over with, she turns right over to Jeff to press him about how he got cheated on on TV. One thing I noticed about the Aftermath episodes in this season is that they're a lot less rigid and formulaic than they were in action. While in the second season they stuck pretty hard to the structure of the talk show, they really are much more freeform in their writing and storytelling this time around, and that will only be made more clear in the following episodes. Blainly and Jeff are constantly fighting over control of the show, and often that comes at the expense of the eliminated contestants being able to have their whole interview thing. The first big part of this episode is the Total Drama Fugitive segment, which is focused on the mysterious disappearances of Duncan and Zeke. After refusing to sing, Duncan was the first contestant in Total Drama history to quit. Um, no. What about DJ in action? Or Harold's like, three episodes ago. They both left the show on their own terms even though they weren't voted off. That's one thing that kind of confuses me. The show presents Duncan quitting as if it's some big deal when it really isn't. I don't really get it. Whatever. The segment is pretty cool though. Basically what is shown is a bunch of found footage of alleged Duncan and Ezekiel sightings, as if they were Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster or something. Actually, they even do a parody of the whole Loch Ness thing. So, you gotta tell me what you saw. Ach, the Loch was long and I the gloom and I the poverty. What are you saying? Uh, excuse me. As a person of Scottish descent, I happen to find that to be pretty funny. The Ezekiel stuff especially is pretty badass. It reminds me of those cheesy cryptid caught on tape videos I occasionally watch. Like and subscribe right now, or this spider will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Do you think your flight will be safe? Ezekiel is the name of a mysterious creature that is said to appear on airplanes. He's described as looking very scruffy and wearing dirty, worn out clothing. Some people believe that Ezekiel does not exist, but these five pieces of footage might make you think otherwise. Number five, Ezekiel filmed under plane wing. 
Here we see some fat kid sleeping on a plane. And then he looks outside and sees what appears to be a figure on the bottom of the wing. A lot of people think this is Ezekiel because it looks like him. The video got over a million views in two days. A lot of people are skeptical, but many others are very sure that this is a real Ezekiel. The interviews in this episode are pretty short-lived. Like, Harold is probably less than a minute. The rest is dedicated to just a comedic scene about how everyone hates him and then he gets a musical number. The musical number is called Baby, and I was originally expecting to tell you guys that I didn't like the song much, but upon hearing it again, my opinion changed. It's definitely not the show's best song, but I think that if nothing else, it's a really funny scene, especially when all the girls freak out. So I don't really have any complaints. After a lot of resistance, Blainley finally manages to break through Jeff's stalling and move the show to Bridget's segment. And before she comes on stage, we get to see a really heartfelt conversation where Beth tries to encourage her to apologize and tell Jeff how she feels. And I really like it. Many people don't seem to like Beth as much as I do, but I think she is really well characterized here. That extends to Jeff and Bridget too. I know I was critical of their conflicts in the previous season, but this time around I really like how their issues are done. Bridget comes on and sings a song to apologize, and my opinion on this one is like my opinion on Harold's song. It's not the catchiest song, but there are some elements I at least like. I really like how her lyrics get more and more dumb and juvenile as time goes on, and somehow that actually works to win Jeff over. It's pretty funny to me. Know what I always wanted to do when I was hosting this show? Make out with a hot Spanish dude? Alejandro is Spanish? I always assumed he was South American. Blainley continues to drive the wedge between the two, and eventually she hosts a new segment where the two beat the crap out of each other. Who's ready for the first sanctioned beatdown in Aftermath history? Pull up a chair and hit record on your PVRs, cause it's time for our main event. But within, like, literally less than 10 seconds, Brick and Jeff immediately fall in love with each other again and start making out, which really ticks Blainley off. <laughs> Oh, never leave me again. Oh, you're so much better than that pole. <gasps> Ouch. Sorry. Guess you guys just weren't meant to be. So, what are you doing later? You two-timing harlot. First Justin, then Harold, and now a pole. Have you no heart, Beth? <sighs> Brady doesn't deserve a girl like you. Anyway, because Blainley is having a mental breakdown and Jigit are making out, we get a once-in-a-lifetime treat of having Eva send the show off, and she does an awesome job at ending this awesome episode. Episode 7 starts out like most episodes, with some in-flight banter between teams, including some of the best dialogue between the Amazons. There, there, cutie pie. <laughs> oh, you're so cute when you're terrified. <laughs> Does she keep her thumbs in her armpits when we're not looking? Cody is so into me. I can't believe there are people out there that dislike Sierra. How do people dislike a character like this? Anyway, the challenge starts with the campers being dumped in the middle of the Alps in Germany. Before any team-based challenge takes place, Chris forces the teams to sing a song, but quietly, as to avoid any avalanches. The contestants sing a song to the tune of Ein Klein, and it's a pretty nice one, the lyrics are pretty funny, and it also does an interesting job at establishing some juicy character drama. Alejandro begins using his charm to woo over Lashana, and she is pretty quickly won. Also, Lindsay suddenly remembers who Tyler is. I've seen people complain about Lindsay's whole forgetfulness thing being taken too far, and although it never bothered me personally, <laughs> I can definitely see where they're coming from. Hi, Daryl! It's me, Tyler! Season one! You and I were together! You must have me confused with someone else. The only guy I was ever into on the show is Tyler, and he's never coming back. The whole idea of Lindsay just not being able to realize Tyler exists is kind of dumb, but honestly the show embraces the silliness of it all and makes it pretty funny. Anyway, once Lindsay suddenly remembers Tyler, he screams so loud that he causes an avalanche, but the ramifications are pretty quickly swept away and we are seemingly instantly transitioned to the next part of the challenge, creating gigantic sausages and using them as sleds to ride down a hill. I don't think people acknowledge how ridiculous some of these challenges are as much as they should. Some of them are just absurd. The sequences of everyone trying to stuff their sausages and coming across weird obstacles is really great, even funnier than usual. Ugh, Cody's got a tiny sausage. At least my team has a sausage. 
Team Victory manages to be the only team to finish their sausage. The Amazons only make a thin, pathetic pile of salmonella, and Team Chris only makes Owen fatter than normal. Despite this, all three teams go down the hill in some way. Forgot to mention, watch out for the rabid mountain goats. They're super deadly. <laughs> we brought them in special. The last part of the challenge involves the campers engaging in a cornerstone of German culture. Dance Dance Revolution. What? The challenge is simple. Just do the right dances or you get shocked. Or something. Now that I think about it, it's not really clear. It doesn't help that none of the campers use the DDR boards properly because the animators are too lazy to rig them any differently than usual. <laughs> Ignore those who do not know fabulous dancing when they see it. Truly? You are fabulous. You mustn't hold back any longer. You're right, Candy Apple. Clear the way. This dance train is leaving the station. I'm disappointed, Heather. You're above petty teasing. No, I'm not. Ugh! <laughs> I don't know why, but the delivery of that line is just so funny to me. Suddenly, the challenge changes, and now the campers are trying to sumo each other off the boards. Not unlike the pillar challenge from last season. Which, if that's anything to go off of, is a good sign. Round one, fight! Ow! I'm gonna seize the you! You've had this coming for three seasons! Ugh! Yeah! Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah! Finish her! Fatality. Upon witnessing this whole event, Alejandro just kinda surrenders himself to Sierra. In return, she smacks the hell out of him, and Team Amazon wins the challenge. We won? I won? I won? I won? I won? Thank you, Mimi. Thank you, I don't get it. How do people see a scene like that and not be entertained? Sierra haters are out of their minds. I don't really know why Team Amazon won, though. I guess it's because Lashana jumped off the board on her own and was thus not on it anymore or something. It doesn't make that much sense, because Heather was still knocked off first. I don't really know why Alejandro threw the challenge either. In fact, it's not really explained why Team Victory is in last place. A lot of things in this episode just don't make that much sense. Dude, seriously, what happened? Heather sacrificed herself to distract me, and her brilliant plan worked. I am most disappointed in myself. Mm. That being said, it's still really, really funny. Anyway, Lashana gets voted off. It's not really explained why. It's even weirder when Alejandro gives her his kiss of evil manipulation right before she takes the drop, as if he played her like a fiddle. But all he really did was butter her up. And if anything, that worked to her benefit, because she kicked a lot of ass in the challenges. I feel bad for Lashana fans. There hasn't been a single time she's been eliminated from the show in a satisfying way. The next episode has this title, which I guess pronounced out loud would be the Am ah! Zon Race, or something like that. And like the name suggests, we visit the Amazon Rainforest, specifically the part of it in Peru. Team Amazon in the Amazon? That's gotta be a lucky sign. You jinxed it, Gwen. Ooh. Whenever a team predicts good luck, they always lose! But I didn't... No, I just meant... I... Gosh, I hope none of the Amazon said this might be lucky for them. That'd be disastrous! <laughs> the forest challenge is refreshingly simple. All the campers have to do is make a long trek from the middle of the forest to Machu Picchu, where they have to do a treasure hunt. And based on the real world distance between the denser parts of the Amazon and their destination, they're probably going to get a fantastic calf workout. The runtime is spent pretty well. The writers do a great job stacking this episode with tons of memorable slapstick and dialogue. Team Amazon is on fire like always, but the other teams are also at their entertainment value peak here. Team Victory gets attacked by a pack of monkeys. Team Chris gets attacked by a bunch of like, scolipedes or something. And Team Amazon gets attacked by a bunch of Zingzings, which are a fictional uncontacted tribe from the Amazon. And in all the chaos, Gwen accidentally gets shot with Cody's EpiPen, which is pretty funny. Chris, 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 it's Gwen! Walkie talkies are for emergencies only. The Zingies pop of the tree ties up with my hands and Cody's pants. This 
double as big! Way to go, Cody! Thank you! Spears broke Zoogles, help us! Hey there, Delilah, what's it like in New York City? I'm a thousand miles... The whole situation leads into the Gypsy rap song, which is called that for some reason. Like, I legitimately don't know. But that's what it says in the wiki, and I'm sure that everything written on the Total Drama wiki is true. It's a fun song. I really like the flamenco-esque guitar work along with Heather's singing, and Gwen's rap is pretty funny. But it's also really short, so there's not much to really say. Right after the song, Heather gets recognized as an ancient Zing Zing goddess and is freed by her newfound worshippers. They even replace her lost tooth with a new golden one, which adds to her new iconic appearance of this season. I really like how throughout the show they've made Heather evolve visually. It's a really cool little custom. Team Victory and Team Chris both make it to Machu, and for the first time ever, Victory wins a challenge! Also for the first time, the Amazons lose and have to vote someone off. And to add insult to injury, the Zing Zings weren't even real Zing Zings. They were just actors dressed up like Zing Zings. Because they were playing the porters in a jungle production of Macbeth. That's one elaborate ass joke. Oh great, it's Pirate Pablo. Ah, Heather, cheer up. Your departure will make the game a whole lot easier for me. I know you messed with Lashana. And Bridget too, probably. You are just lucky you didn't try anything on me. Ah, but with the temptation of a kiss, even you can resist me forever. I would have crushed you. This season's gonna get good, man. I can feel it. Anyway, Heather actually gets the most votes and is almost eliminated. Until Chris says it was just a reward challenge. He just did a voting ceremony and played all the votes to stress everybody out. Especially Sierra. I vote for Sierra. She's like the stalker girlfriend I always thought I wanted. Until I got one. Oh boo hoo Cody. Wah wah. I want personal boundaries and respect and to not have my stuff rummaged through by my biggest fan. Wah wah. I'm Cody. Shut up you little turd. So Cody makes Sierra cry. Heather swears vengeance, and episode 8 comes to its conclusion. Episode 9 brings us to Paris, France, which means the Total Drama plane has literally gone straight from the middle of Europe to rural South America right back to the middle of Europe. That's gotta be real rough on the fuel bills. Our previous episode had our campers running around the jungle and destroying national wonders, but today our campers will be running around the Louvre and destroying national treasures. It's a pretty simple challenge filled with good old-fashioned Total Drama staples. They have to gather pieces of famous sculptures and rebuild them, while also being pursued by a bunch of wild animals. Last team to build their sculpture properly loses the challenge. Team Amazon has to find Michelangelo's David, Team Victory has to find the Thinker, and Team Chris has to find... But the Thinker isn't located in the Louvre, and the Statue of David isn't even in France. Well, we're not using the actual statues. Those are priceless. Chef made some fake ones, right? Why are you running? Why are you running? While trying to find their pieces, Team Amazon is confronted with a serious problem. Sierra will not stop crying. And to get things back to normal, Cody is made to try and cheer her up. Ah! Okay, Sierra, snap out of it. Snap out of it! <laughs> the whole situation leads into this episode's song, Paris in the Springtime. It's centered around Sierra's feeling of betrayal, and it is both really memorable and really creative. I love the use of paintings and the visuals especially, and I also just adore Sierra's lines, especially the ones where she does these absurd run-on sentences. I have one complaint though, and it's with the scene where she talks about how she got on the show. If you fall in love with a boy on TV and then audition to get on a show and then audition again and finally get on a show and be nice to him and do nothing but kiss up, you will stay! This is like Spongebob levels of inconsistency, if not worse. It's the kind of lapse in the show's set continuity that genuinely baffles me. Owen's family information was understandable, but this, it's ridiculous. If you recall the season 2 special, you'd remember that Sierra got into season 3 because she was with the cast when Chris rescued them from the ravine. There was never any audition process, not any we know of. So why is this line here? 
This lends a lot of credence to my theory that this season was written out of order and originally Sierra and Alejandro were introduced with no backstory. And by the time they were writing the script for the special, the Paris episode was too far into production to be revised. That's just my speculation though. Anyway, not long after the song, Cody eventually apologizes to Sierra and cheers her up. Right after, it's revealed that she never was that sad and only was trying to play hard to get. While DJ and Lindsay look for their pieces, they come across an Egypt exhibit and DJ goes off to find something that might break his curse. He ends up taking a mummified dog, hoping he would somehow take it back to Egypt, but it appears that it only makes his curse worse. In the process, he gets the crap beaten out of him by the animals and crashes into his team statue that was almost complete. <gasps> I love Izzy so much. So once again, Team Victory loses. I kind of find it a little silly that they decided to do this whole three teams thing just to make it so the same team loses every single elimination challenge up to this point. That's not a super big complaint though. To determine who takes the drop of shame, Lindsay and DJ have a tiebreaker challenge. Since this is the first time we've had a two person team elimination scenario, I've decided to do something special. Since we're in the fashion capital of the world, I declare that it's a walk-off, people. It's a walk-off. Oh man, I hate walking. <laughs> this season really excels in the humor department, and the timing is always impeccable. DJ and Lindsay design outfits to be modeled, and whoever has the worst outfit gets eliminated. And what I find so funny about the scenario is how stacked it seems. Lindsay is the more fashion aware of the victory duo, and DJ is also trying to lose because he wants to go home and stop hurting animals. But despite all this, DJ ends up winning. Lindsay's design for Tyler was so ugly and stupid that DJ essentially won by default by just remaking his own outfit, I think. It's not directly stated if DJ even makes any clothing. So my new headcanon is that DJ just gave Gwen his spare clothes, which makes this entire scene even funnier than it already is. The cherry on top is the dialogue between Chris, Heather, and Owen acting as the judges, which is hilarious. For the sake of time, I can't really show it, but it's pristine. So Lindsay sadly takes the drop, and she doesn't even get to kiss Tyler goodbye, because Chris is a jerk. All in all though, this is a really funny episode. The fact that DJ is all alone on his own team puts him in the sights of Heather and Alejandro. Because of his independence, they both seem as a very valuable person to have as a potential ally, and a lot of episode 10 is centered on the two of them doing whatever they can to win his favor. The plane lands in the middle of the ocean, because apparently it can do that, and it turns out the cast has been dropped in the water surrounding Newfoundland the Canadian province that I pretty much only know anything about because of this episode. The first part of the challenge is to swim to a bunch of boats and ride them to shore. <laughs> Ow! DJ, catch! <gasps> Care to join me in an alliance? You're asking him that now? You're just jealous because you didn't think of it. Actually, I'd have asked him before delivering the cushion, but you do what's right for you. Oh, he is good. <sighs> I want the tape. Give me the tape! How do you open this thing? I don't think I've directly said it, but I think I've made it pretty clear that I really like Heather in this season. You know, Heather really shouldn't let her obvious crush on Alejandro get in the way of the game. Having a relationship with Duncan really screwed things up for me last season. Trent! I meant Trent. Just a slip of the tongue. <laughs> I want that tape back! Give me the tape! How do you open this thing? I'll take the point. Okay, let's not get too crazy here. I've got point. Look, I'm a very experienced swimmer. I was a synchro captain. I coach minnows. I am a CIT. More like a BITC. Guys, let's get going. God, it's a little bit too unfair for Heather and Courtney to be on the same team. Their amazing presence takes up so much space that it's so hard for any other character to have the same impact. Heather leaves her team ship to try and get DJ to stay in the challenge, and although he doesn't want to use his boat, she persists. As the campers row, they are tasked with singing this episode's song, and it's once again a really good one. I'm being generally positive about these songs, but this one is definitely in the upper half. To quote Heather, it's a sea shanty and it's darn catchy. DJ tries to not sing in order to get kicked off the show, but Heather manages to trick him into dropping a bar or two and he stays in. 
But honestly, I don't think Chris actually cares if the contestants refuse to sing, based on Cody's whole situation. As everyone continues to row, Team Amazon stops at some random rock, because Gwen and Courtney get convinced that a formation they see up high is Duncan, and because of this, they effectively guarantee themselves last place. It's about time you guys got back. Where's Duncan? We thought we saw him. It was just a bunch of dumb rocks. It's a stone, Luigi. You didn't make it. It's a Duncan. That happens to people whenever they want to see someone they really like. This one time, I saw Cody riding a white horse outside my bedroom window. And this was before I even knew him. Please, can we stop this story now? I ended up picking thorns out of my tissue for like a week. Because I jumped out the window. To get on the horse. And I landed on a rose bush. I'm starting to think Sierra's where fictional characters peaked. Like, there's nowhere else to go. Our literary tradition has basically been finished. You were dreaming. We weren't. To say that we saw Duncan just because we want to is crazy talk. You do want to see him, don't you? Of course. A lot. But that doesn't explain why Gwen saw him. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> hmm. The second half of the challenge is a screeching in ceremony where the campers have to drink vinegar decipher Newfoundland slang, and kiss a cod. DJ obviously doesn't want to engage, but Heather and Alejandro both cook up ways to keep him going. To start, Heather tricks him into drinking the vinegar by telling him it's medicine. And right after, DJ is able to interpret the Newfoundland slang on complete accident, which makes for a pretty funny scene. Team Chris and DJ remain neck and neck up to the cod kissing, and that's when things get really interesting. Heather notices the fish has an eye of Anubis on it, and tells DJ that it's a sign of a potential way to break his curse. DJ is skeptical, but Alejandro intervenes and tells him he agrees with Heather. So DJ decides to take the shot, and really gives the fish a smooch of its life. Like, that's not an obligatory peck. There's tongue there. Tyler also manages to kiss the fish by pretending it's Lindsay, so Team Chris and Team Victory tie, right as the Amazons finally make it. Though, are you really winning when you make out with a cod? Okay, fine. So, I did let a guy get in the way of how I played the game. I really can't stop thinking about how Duncan could just abandon me like this and I... I messed up. Did I just say that on air? I want that tape back! Give me the tape! Oh! How do you open this thing? It's okay, Courtney. There's no need to be hard on yourself. Everybody makes mistakes. Like, for example, I accidentally wrote the wrong episode number for Hot Campshire in the action video. And I miscalculated how much Robux can be bought with 100 grand in the island video. The key to maintaining your degree of confidence is to just never mention your faults in front of anybody else, and you'll be fine. And I just broke my own rule. Crap. I want that tape back! Give me the tape! Ugh, how do you open this thing? The episode ends off with a pretty kick-ass twist. Alejandro shows a bucket of Anubis fish and reveals to the camera that he is the one who gave them their symbols, all as an elaborate ruse to convince DJ he could break the curse. The show really wants you to think it's badass. Like, the way they present it is as if it's some plot twist that has been built up to for entire seasons, but I like that confidence. Speaking of confidence, Alejandro's efforts did a great job at bringing back DJ's head into the game with newfound Moxie. He's in it to win it, and luckily, the cast's next destination is his home country of Jamaica. Yeah, DJ is canonically Jamaican. It's never said in the show, but it was on the Total Drama Totally Interactive website. Would have been nice to have some teammates again. But at least with Alejandro, I've got an ally who's reliable, dependable, and totally trustworthy. <laughs> Subtle, Fresh TV. Subtle. Owen talks with Noah about his somewhat rocky relationship with Izzy. And when I say rocky, I mean she has a knack for causing him serious pain and he is starting to be worried for his safety. He decides he will try and break up with her, but calamity strikes before he gets the chance. The plane runs out of fuel and begins to fall out of the sky. Izzy opens the plane and jumps out of it, and Owen gets sucked out in the process. He lands on a beach, and surprisingly, is fine. Well, he is, until Izzy lands right on his balls, and then the entire plane falls right on top of them. Two airports on an island the size of a postage stamp, and he misses both. But somehow, it's my fault. You blew our money for the season on Chris work. Chris? Owen and Izzy need help! Savor this scene while it lasts, because it might just be the last time ever in all of Total Drama that Courtney ever shows any reasonable human compassion. Owen and Izzy are taken to the hospital, and the attitudes of the two are yin and yang, basically. 
Owen feels regret and shame at how he got Izzy hurt, even though he really didn't do anything. In fact, Izzy is the reason he got shot out of the plane in the first place, but Izzy doesn't care about anything involving her injury at all. Well, she... just play the clip. I wanted to break up with her and the plane broke her up! It's like I made it happen with my mind! Owen, I've devised a mathematical formula for infinite time travel. Oh, this is so worse than I thought! Yeah. The first part of this episode's challenge is a relay dive thing where campers have to dive off a cliff in a shark and eel infested water to retrieve pirate treasure. It's pretty straightforward, but there are a few good laughs that we get while it happens. A good few chuckles. Gwen manages to find the gold first, but then gets shocked by some eels. Alejandro then jumps into the water and comes back out with Gwen and the gold on his neck. But his opportunism doesn't quite work out for him, because Heather steals it right back from him, winning the challenge. The episode then transitions back to Owen and Izzy in the infirmary now being joined by Gwen. They reflect on her sudden change in character, and then what I assume is the Canadian military just shows up and takes her because she's smart or whatever. That's scary. Imagine being forced to work with the military without your consent. Ugh, that'd be terrible. FBI, oh shit! The whole situation leads into this episode's song, and it is genuinely one of the sweetest ones in the entire season. Like, I've been super positive, all things considered, but I would say that this one is probably top 5. It's basically a cute little love song about Owen's regret with how his relationship with Izzy came to an end. I also love Gwen's appearance and backup vocals here. The friendship between Gwen and Owen is something that's been pretty dormant since Island, so seeing the two together again after so long is nostalgic. And on top of all that, the whole song is done in the Owen Crayon style, which I love. So yeah, fantastic bit. The second half of the challenge takes place on a haphazardly created roller coaster thing that the campers have to race on as fast as possible. Because, yeah, Jamaica and roller coasters, those two things are certainly very related. The campers have to ride down the track on longboards in teams of two, and the ones who take the least amount of time over three rounds win. It's a fun challenge, but I find myself conflicted because I'm not sure what formulaic video game gag I should do for this part. It wouldn't really be complete without one. Hmm. Oh, I got it! Get it? Because Double Dash has two characters, and the characters are riding in groups of two- yeah. I also consider doing something like a Tony Hawk's Pro Skater thing, but full disclosure, I've never actually played any of those games, so I wouldn't really know what to do. Anyway, in the first two rounds, both Team Amazon and Team Chris do really well, but both of them are completely dwarfed by DJ's excellent performance. He really just has his drift boosting buckled down. Alejandro is intimidated by this, so he plays his trump card. He tells DJ that the fish's symbol was faked in order to make him feel better about his curse and this seems to really break his spirits. In finding out the fish was a hoax seems to have brought back his knack for hurting animals, with his last run leaving a trail of innocent animal carnage. I guess you could say that DJ's belief in the curse is what gave it so much power. In other words, Your thoughts create your reality. DJ has Chris to thank for his departure. Not allowed on my team, and no merge on the horizon? Bye bye. Nothing personal. <laughs> So, DJ gets eliminated from the show, and luckily for him, he doesn't have to do the usual drop of shame. The plane is out of gas and the show has no money to buy more, after all. It's kind of perplexing though. I never understood the thought process behind doing this whole three-team thing for the season and just not really utilizing it. The writers essentially cleaned out Team Victory as fast as they could, and with the exception of Izzy and Duncan, every single elimination so far has been from that team. But whatever. In some ways, it's actually pretty funny. The next episode is episode 12, and as you all hopefully know, 12 is a multiple of 6. You know what that means, it's aftermath time. And this is a special one, special enough for Jeff and Bridget to actually dress up. They never really seem to do that much. The episode acts as a telethon to raise money for the show, because Chris happened to spend all the show's budget on personal amenities like his hot tub. Which, I mean, I'm no lawyer, but that probably fits under the definition of embezzlement. Somebody should probably put that on his crimes list. Blainley also appears too, because apparently Celebrity Manhunt refused to hire her back. Ouch. Unless we raise more dough for fuel, our friends could be stranded in Jamaica 
forever. Oh God, being stranded in Jamaica, that would be so awful. We pretty quickly transition to this episode's first song, Save This Show. It's nothing particularly special, but it's not really that bad either. I find the whole sonic direction of it to be at least a little bit interesting though. The heavy auto-tune and reverb-soaked piano makes this sound like one of those early 2010s 808s and Heartbreak ripoffs. In order to incentivize viewers to donate money, the show pulls a whole bunch of stunts, including questionable gifts. For a donation of just $25, you'll get a commemorative box of delicious and nutritious yummy Happy Go Time fish tails. Strictly decorative, do not eat, may not be legal in all provinces, keep out of reach of children. And for 50 bucks, you'll get a special commemorative total drama t-shirt. That shirt sucks. Look at my shirt. It's way better. And I only got it for $25.95. Jeff, Bridget, and Blainley have trouble at first but it doesn't take them super long to get into the telethon vibe. All they have to do is hold a bunch of content hostage behind paywalls in order to lure their idiot fans into wasting their money. It's that easy. It sometimes boggles my mind how so many people can be so gullible. By the way, if you're enjoying this content and would like to see more like it, feel free to make a pledge to my Patreon. Having dedicated financial support for my fan base really makes this whole YouTube thing a lot more sustainable and gives me the funds necessary to increase my production quality. $10 patrons are actually able to get exclusive sneak peeks of my content while it's in development, and that includes the total drama videos. Just saying. The guests don't actually contribute much to this episode, and I don't mean that as a complaint. It's just something of interest. Lindsay is basically on and off within a minute, and so is DJ. I don't know why DJ is here, honestly, given that the hosts were just going on about how the cast is stranded in Jamaica. I guess you could argue he took a private flight to Canada on his own, but it still strikes me as something they should have acknowledged. That actually makes me wonder, how do these people make it home after taking the drop? That's never really explained. It may have been a short season for DJ, but it was a long season for the animals. And now they want their turn. If you want to see DJ pet an animal, call in now. Of course, offering DJ to be mauled by a bunch of animals raises a lot of money because it seems to me that the writers of Total Drama are convinced that the most popular aspect of their show is the slapstick. The animals are released and cause mass carnage, destroying the set and making it so that they have to raise an extra 500 grand in repairs. How ironic. Lashana comes on stage and does her song, and once again, it's nothing super standout, but it's not like I hate it or anything. The song is called Sisters, and it's basically an open letter to Alejandro for like, manipulating her or something. As I said earlier, it's never really made clear what Alejandro really did to screw over Lashana so hard, but whatever. Also, funnily enough, Harold joins Lashana in the dance as she sings, Sisters Come Together Now, and I'm not gonna push you, Harold, but you have me wondering if there's anything you'd like to share about yourself with the rest of us. The last guest, and my personal favorite of the episode, is Izzy, also known as Brainzilla. Greetings, carbon-based lifeform, commonly referred to as Bridget. Greetings, carbon-based lifeform, commonly referred to as Jeffrey. Your grammar is appalling. Just a little sodium chloride. Actually, dude, it's salt. That's what I said. No, dude, you said sodium chloride. Yes, it's the same as salt, but you could have just said salt instead. Everyone in this town knows you're a boy genius, dude. You don't need to say overly large words to sound more intelligent. In order to get money, Jeff hosts a quiz segment with Brainzilla, and I think it's a really funny scene. The whole absurdity of Brainzilla being smart enough to calculate the square root of 67 to the 14th decimal point in no time tickles my funny bone in a very, very particular way. Sadly, Brainzilla doesn't last long, as Jeff accidentally injures her and the blockage in her brain seems to return and she is just plain old Izzy again. Which is sad. On the bright side, all the trivia question chaos was able to raise a million dollars. Somehow. I don't know. The velocity of donated money in this episode doesn't really make that much sense in the first place. Whether it makes sense or not, the money is raised and because of that, the Total Drama World Tour machine is up and at him once again. And in this episode, we head over to England. Yeah. Today's challenge is a bit complex. Well, kind of. Essentially, you have to solve a bunch of puzzles to catch Jack the Ripper before he catches you. Teenagers solving mysteries while they slowly get picked off? What is this, Danganronpa? <laughs> the first clue that the team gets is somewhere hidden in the clothing of a completely immobile British guard, and the campers have to take off his clothes until they come across it. I know that sounds ridiculous, but 
It's basically just done as a pun on changing of the guard. Yeah. I'm not complaining though, because it leads right into one of the show's best songs. Like, seriously. Strip Them Down will come up in any conversation about the Total Drama World Tour soundtrack, because it really is not just memorable, but the gold standard of musical comedic storytelling. If we're gonna find that clue, there's only one thing to do. For someone to strip him down, and switch he or do that to you. I think my favorite part of the song is Courtney's outro. The note she holds goes on for a while, and it is legitimately super impressive. Totally If you don't know, by the way, Courtney's voice actress is a professional jazz singer. That's why she can do that. The only complaint I have is that Cody can visibly be seen not singing. Come on, Cody, live a little. Something that's really noticeable about this episode is the growing friendship between Gwen and Courtney. They've been a bit at odds throughout the season, but this episode is the first time where we actually get to see the two really working together as friends. It's nice to see, and I wish the show presented more positive relationships like this more often, because we could really use some more smiles. Well, I shouldn't complain, because they're two peas in a pod and I love it. They seem to have a friendship that's destined to last. They're inseparable. One moment of note during the challenge is when Noah starts talking shit about Alejandro. He brings up how he thinks Al has ulterior motives and shouldn't be trusted. Which, I mean, he is right. I'm really just telling you this because it's going to bite him in the ass later on. As the challenge continues, more and more members of each team get caught by the Ripper, until the only members left on the teams are Gwen and Courtney on Amazon and Noah and Owen on Chris. It all comes down to one last riddle. The Ripper's most natural place has two levels that make up the space. <laughs> sure. Easy peasy. Double decker bus? Yeah. So there is a brain in there. You've been holding out on me. Holding out? I told you I smuggled some wieners off the plane. Owen and Noah make their way back to the double-decker bus that they started the episode on, while Gwen and Courtney make their way to Whitechapel because that was where most of the Ripper's murders took place. And sadly for Amazon, they don't find the Ripper, but Team Chris does, and they catch him in a hilarious scene involving corgis, sausages, and farts. However, in a cruel twist of events, they don't win the challenge. Gwen and Courtney made their way to some nasty punk club, and you won't believe what they found! Duncan! And because Chris seems to really like Duncan, he gives victory to the Amazons, even though Team Chris actually won the challenge by finding the Ripper, who turns out to be Ezekiel, looking, like, really messed up. Team Chris does get Duncan, though. They go to vote, and sadly, Noah takes the drop of shame. And this is probably one of the less elaborated eliminations. It turns out that Alejandro saw Noah talking smack, and that's used as the explanation for Noah's drop but it's not really said who votes for whom this time around. The only bit of info we get is that Noah got three votes against him. It's said later on that Alejandro and Tyler voted together, but it's not said who cast the third vote. The most likely option is Duncan, but it's never said what his motivations were. I think this is just a rare example of something we saw a lot more of in season one, which is campers being voted off without much concrete justification. It's not the end of the world though, I guess. All in all, this episode is still pretty great. I'm especially super excited for Duncan to be back, because, as you all know, I'm a big fan of him and Courtney as a couple. Oh my gosh, I didn't lock the door? The lock's busted. What happened to your paw? This is so stupid, but I have no idea, and I'm so glad you're here to mock me about it. Me too. Ow. Hey. No! 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 What you're going through is very painful, I know that. You get stabbed in the ribs. That's painful. This shit, I don't feel nothing. Nothing. Dead. Empty. What else? Where I am. <laughs> you total drama writers, all you do is break my heart. Every single time you create something beautiful, you just, you just immediately destroy it.
In a matter of two minutes, you gave me so much hope. So much excitement for my favorite couple in the series to interact again. And you tore it apart right in front of me. You shattered it like glass. <laughs> Do you enjoy this? Do you enjoy making me feel like this? Well, uh, at the very least, Gwen and Duncan clearly are on edge after this. Gwen continues to be nice to Courtney, but it is obvious that she is having a hard time looking her in the eye. And Duncan, well... Oh, wow, that was a deep sleep. The sleep of the dead. <laughs> you know what I mean, Tyler? Dead. <sighs> that was a deep sleep. It's like someone stabbed me 47 times. Or twisted my fucking neck like a bottle cap. Alejandro clearly notices the unspoken tension and tries to find out what's going on throughout the episode. But we'll get to that when we get to it. For now, we're going to Italy, the home of the first Olympic Games. Wait. The campers inform Chris that the Olympics are actually from Greece because he apparently did not know that. The plane adjusts its course accordingly, but for some reason in the transition shot, it shows the plane heading to Greece from North America, even though they were in London in the last episode. Now that I think about it, the distance from London to Greece can be crossed by plane in just a couple of hours, but the episode acts like it's been at least a night or two since the last one, so I don't really know what the plane's been doing in the air all this time. The first Olympic challenge is a scavenger hunt in the Parthenon, where two competitors have to face off against a boar for a gold medal. Duncan and Gwen volunteer at the same time, and quickly regret that decision. Awkward! Did you see those sparks? Gwen's had a crush on Duncan from season one, and he's always had something for her, too. There's a whole fan base dedicated to Gwenkin. I wonder if this year, a new relationship fan base will start for Siodi. Ah! No, no, Kodera. Ah! She was right. It did happen. During this challenge, we get this episode's song, a duet between our two boar hunters, and, well, it's pretty good, actually. Duncan's voice actor is a surprisingly good singer, and the subject matter is definitely interesting. You can see Alejandro sneaking around trying to figure out what's going on between them, but he seems to have trouble making any conclusions, as if it wasn't, like, the most obvious thing in the world. One funny thing about this song, though, is that they refer to the boar as a bear for what I assume is the sake of rhyme. Otherwise, in the episode, they just call it a boar. But, to be honest, that boar really doesn't look like a boar. This honestly perplexed me for years, but I'm now just figuring out that this isn't actually supposed to be a real boar in the show. It's literally just a typical total drama bear that they added fake tusks to, so it would resemble one. So, it's like, a boar bear. Ugh, I'm now getting flashbacks to Avatar The Last Airbender. The king is having a party at the palace tonight for his pet bear. You mean, platypus bear? No, it just says bear. Certainly you mean his pet skunk bear. Or his armadillo bear. Gopher bear? Just... bear. The second challenge is a game of Pancration featuring two members from each team. Alejandro and Owen volunteer first for Team Chris, even though Tyler wanted to compete. Alejandro decides to give Tyler his spot in return for a favor. The match starts out pretty normal, but takes a turn when Courtney insults Cody. This triggers a burst of anger from Sierra, and she disregards the rules and beats the crap out of Courtney, kind of making Team Chris win by default. The third challenge is a one-on-one -on -one hurdling competition between Heather and Alejandro, and it goes pretty well. Alejandro starts out in the lead, but his urge to be cocky and show off ends up losing him the challenge. So, after the first three challenges, Team Amazon and Team Chris are neck and neck and have a tiebreaker. The challenge is using a bunch of man-made wings to fly into the air and retrieve a medal being held up by a crane. And this is where things get interesting. Alejandro sees the challenge as losable, so he decides to take out his secret weapon. He tells Tyler that it's time for him to pay back his favor, and then Tyler blushes and tells him that he only likes girls. And then, Alejandro takes off his pants. Just kidding! That's- that's not what happened. It's not. Part of me didn't want to make a joke referencing the Ala Tyler video here, but I figured that this really wouldn't be complete without it. What Alejandro does is just a little bit less absurd. He tells Tyler to tell everybody what he saw happen between Duncan and Gwen. Tyler testifies, and Courtney freaks out. Duncan shows up a bit late, mocks Cody, and gets socked like holy hell. Fly, Cody, fly! Cody, stay where you are. But we'll lose. <gasps> oh. Cody, stay where you are. You are so eliminated. 
She's got my vote. Agreed. Oh, shut up, Heather. No one forgot what you did with Trent. Even though half of Team Amazon wants to throw the challenge, Cody perseveres and starts flying up to win the challenge and keep Gwen from being voted out. And it works. Tyler's wings melt Icarus style, and Cody grabs the medal just in time. I'll do anything for Gwen. She has to kiss me eventually. Team Chris is sent to the elimination ceremony, and this time around, Duncan gets voted out. But Chris vetoes the vote because, well, I'm pretty sure you can see why. There's a lot of bad blood and heated emotions to be filmed and put on the television for all our viewing pleasures. Also, why is Heather comforting Courtney? Is that a strategic thing or does she genuinely care that much about... Never mind. Now that I think about it, the answer to that question is pretty obvious. Spoiler alert for the rest of this video. I'm not personally the biggest fan of this whole Duncan, Gwen, Courtney arc, if that wasn't already clear. With the whole breakup between Duncan and Courtney, there is a ton of divide between the entire cast. The wedge between Team Amazon is obvious, but even Team Chris is experiencing tension. Alejandro decides to use all the chaos as an opportunity to throw the Amazons off their game. In order to try and confuse Courtney, he plants the idea in her head to try and make Duncan jealous by flirting with another guy. So, naturally, she picks Tyler. Oh my god. Episode 15's challenge takes place in Area 51, and it's pretty simple. Well, simple conceptually. The cast has to sneak into the area, steal an alien artifact, and return it to the plane in good condition. The hard part is breaking into the facility in the first place, unless you find a random opening in the fence, that is. This episode's song is Boyfriend Kisser, and it's alright. It's not one of my personal favorites, but not one of my least favorites either. It's basically just Courtney and Heather trashing on Gwen, and once again, Cody doesn't sing. I'm starting to forget to even point that out. I definitely like the second half of the episode more than the first. Once the cast makes it into the warehouse filled with extraterrestrial artifacts, things start getting really funny. The alien scenes are really enjoyable, if not sometimes confusing. Like, Owen gets caught in a trap, and while he is restrained, some computer thing gives him clown makeup. That's it. That's all that happens to him. Ah! Hey, oh, I can't it's, believe- it's, uh, You go first. Okay. The kiss was awesome, even though now everyone on my team thinks I'm the new Heather. Even Heather. But I can see that Courtney's ridiculous flirting is getting to you. So if you've changed your mind about our sick. Boo! 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 I am a shadow, the true self. Actually, wait, I have a better joke. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, two Cody's! I'm confused and excited. Ah! Okay, now I'm just confused. Both teams have their difficulties getting a working artifact. It certainly doesn't help that Courtney is now trying to throw challenges and Owen is well, Owen. Team Chris is the first to get an artifact, a living facehugger thing, but because Tyler accidentally steps on a mine on the way back, the alien presumably dies and turns into just a bunch of goo. So the Amazons win the challenge with their cube thing, despite all of Courtney's constant meddling. Tyler is the one voted off, presumably because of the deal Duncan struck with Alejandro earlier and the fact that he was responsible for the dead alien. People really hate each other right now. The tension is so thick, you can cut it with a knife or crush it with your hands, or snap Grab its neck, neck with, with your, your wrist. wrist. Courtney is really intent on kicking Gwen off the show and tries to get the others to vote with her. Hey! Okay, we vote out Gwen next, agreed? Not if you're gonna try and make us lose on purpose again. <gasps> I did no such thing. But on the off chance our winning streak does end, I want to guarantee that Pasty McJerkface goes home first, okay? Sure. If you give me a guarantee, you won't vote me off instead. Deal. Of course my fingers were crossed. It's one of the advantages of making deals in the dark. This feeling, it's bizarre. Am I, am I rooting for someone other than Courtney? Season three is weird, man. While Courtney works to get rid of Gwen, Gwen tries to get people like Cody to vote with her. All I have to do is make sure we keep winning until Duncan gets booted. 
Then, maybe Courtney will drop her Gwen vendetta, and my new alliance can get rid of Sierra. Cody, you okay in there? <gasps> Did you fall in? That only happened once! <laughs> <laughs> Team Amazon isn't the only team coming up with schemes though. The guys in Team Chris try to think of a way to take advantage of all the bad blood. Men, we must rise from the ashes and ignite the fires of victory. I'm all for starting fires. The Amazons are only powerful because they have both Courtney and Heather. We need to break them apart, but how? Oh, oh, oh! Act like you're crushing on Heather and she'll go home, same as Bridget and Lashana. Bridget and Lashana? I thought I was the only guy who'd snagged double gold at the Babe Olympics. Uh, yes. I was truly fond of both. Sadly, the fates were against us. You're not that good of a liar when you're confronted with your own actions, Alejandro. Duncan and Alejandro come up with a plan. Alejandro will start flirting with Courtney in order to knock both her and Heather off their game. After all, Courtney has just been cheated on on international TV, and Heather has some unspoken interest in Alejandro. So if nothing else, it will definitely get their attention. The whole ruse works on Courtney, but Heather quickly sees through it. So what does she do? Well, she starts flirting with Duncan, obviously. Ugh, <sighs> these writers really seem to enjoy tormenting me. Anyway, today's episode takes place in Australia, and... Oh, wait a second. And the first part of the challenge is riding emus to the Blue Mountains. And I'm kind of surprised that I'm directly saying this for the first time, but I really love it when this show does animal-related challenges. I would go as far to say that one of the most consistently good forms of comedy in total drama is the animal personification. Shout out to the sandwich bear. It's very fun seeing the cast try and mostly fail to tame the emus, and once they've all gotten one, there are plenty of funny bits surrounding the difficulties of riding an emu that keeps the challenge entertaining. Anyway, after like, several days, the campers finally make it to the goal. I knew the view would be beautiful. Ooh, you're good. Couldn't have said it better myself. The second part of this challenge is a good example of some of the weird shit these campers are forced to do in the season. They have to bungee jump off a cliff into a sheep fold, retrieve a sheep, and then shear it at the top and hopefully come across a tattoo bearing their team's logo. You know, like you do. During this sequence, we get a pretty good song known as We Are Shearing Sheep. And this song is a bit of a special case for me because it's so close to being one of the show's best, but it's just off the bar for two main reasons. Although I think the verses are fine and the visuals are fantastic, I just think the chorus sucks. And I know that sounds like a bit of a switch thinny switch tano criticism, but the whole song's hook is just jarring. The characters just repeat the phrase, we are shearing sheep, several times. The repetition isn't really the issue, it's more so the delivery. It's just super monotone. It's almost as if the cast are intentionally trying to sound as disinterested as possible. It comes off as really weird because the whole badass hard rock theme of the rest of the song. I hope I don't sound too negative though. I guess to counterbalance my long-winded criticism, I should restate how awesome the visuals are here. The intro looks amazing and I love the outfits and sheep audience. None of my complaints about the delivery are a big deal. But you know what is a big deal? Cody isn't singing! Like what the hell? Did his voice actor cut a deal or something? Anyway, even though Team Chris got a late start, they are the first ones to come across a sheep bearing one of their tattoos and win the challenge. So for the first time ever, Team Amazon is sent to the elimination ceremony. And there's no BS fake out bullcrap this time around. Someone's gotta go. So the voting takes place, and well, it's a tie between Gwen and Courtney. And as a tiebreaker to avoid elimination, the two of them have to feed a koala bear eucalyptus leaves without their hands. And if you're expecting a detailed explanation on who wins and loses the challenge, you're not gonna get one. The challenge is over basically as soon as it starts. Gwen is allergic to eucalyptus leaves, and yeah. Within like 20 seconds, Courtney wins the challenge. So Gwen takes the drop. That was anticlimactic. There is something funny about how quickly all the squonking crap happened. Like, literally, Duncan appears at the end of episode 13, and like 40 seconds later, he kisses Gwen. In episode 14, they try and fail to keep the secret. Episode 15 has everyone hating them, and episode 16 has Gwen kicked off and the two basically never interact again. It's not like the back and forth between Alejandro and Heather which has slowly expanded on and on throughout the season. Hell, I'd even argue that the romance between Tyler and Lindsay is more progressively established in this season. But Gwen and Duncan, it comes and goes like a high speed train. Jesus. So, although it seemed that Alejandro and Duncan were pretty chummy in the last episode, this time around they seem to be plotting to completely betray each other. 
Since Team Chris only has three members, they both start working to get Owen on their good side, and it leads to some funny bits later on in the episode. For the next challenge, the plane lands in Sweden. The first part of the challenge is building something out of a bunch of wood. Well, I mean, it's pretty clearly a boat, at least to me, but the campers don't seem to be so sure. While the Amazons are fighting over how to do the challenge, Cody suddenly has a burst of inspiration and goes all out. And well, he builds Gwen's face. Because, well, he really misses Gwen. That's what you made us build? The whole situation leads perfectly into this episode's song. And I'm not kidding, this is arguably the best one in the whole show. It's not my personal favorite, but it is definitely in my top three. The whole song is called We Built Gwen's Face. And yeah, the song is basically about how Team Amazon built Gwen's face. But it's really the execution that makes it so memorable. The whole song and video is a lovable homage to Dancing Queen by ABBA and Europop in general and the hook is just so catchy. I adore the back and forth between the two teams during the chorus, and the costumes, oh, I almost forgot the costumes, just immaculate. We built Gwen's face, we're gonna make first place, because we built Gwen's face. So yeah, all in all, I love this song. Well, except for the fact that Cody doesn't sing. My God, it's almost not funny to point out anymore. Almost. Team Chris builds an awesome Viking ship, and Team Amazon is left way behind with the Gwen Skull, so they have to brainstorm, put their heads together. <laughs> Get it? Because they built a wooden head and sit. Yeah. Hey, focus! Thank you. If Gwen's head is hollow, huh, don't get me started. <laughs> you know, despite my criticisms, this season really is super funny. We can just lop off the top of her head and ride in her like a boat. Done! Off with her head! The second part of the challenge is a naval battle between the Viking ship and Gothhead. And while Team Amazon really stole the show in the building scene, Team Chris really takes the entertainment value gold for the next part of the challenge. The whole shtick of Duncan and Alejandro trying their best to make Owen like them is genuinely super funny and makes for some unique dialogue that we don't usually get in this show. One specific joke that I feel like I should give direct accolades to is that Owen makes a rule on the ship that everyone has to talk like Vikings, but once he enacts the rule, he starts talking like a pirate. And out of fear of making him unhappy, Alejandro and Duncan just go along with it. And it's immaculate. All of this praise I'm giving to Team Chris isn't to say that Team Amazon isn't enjoyable here, by the way. Once the battle gets going, they have plenty of moments to shine too. hardest parts about making this video was having clips of Sierra that I really wanted to show, but not being able to for the sake of time. Because she has so many standout moments. Anyway, Team Chris wins the challenge after they run out of cannonballs and instead use Owen to completely decimate Gwen's face. There's something that's always really funny about Owen being used as a stand-in for inanimate objects. Okay, what is your problem? Surely I do not have to explain it to you. We are in a competition? Oh, sure. So picking off my teammates while you totally blank me is strategy now? Indeed it is. When dealing with jealousy... I am not jealous, you arrogant... Of course I refer to Courtney. I must make her believe no one else exists for me. If she's focused on us, you can blindside her. Believe me, Heather. The only woman I want to look at is you. <laughs> That's... You're, you're so... Whatever. Oh, this is getting good! Also, you can see Ezekiel, but this is getting good! Anyway, Chris once again does his reward challenge fake out and no one gets dropped from Team Amazon. But with everything considered, yeah, this is an awesome episode. When it's not moving the character plots forward, it's probably making you laugh out loud. I'd say it gets three Baileys out of six Chris McLeans. Whatever that means. Uh, 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 uh. 
Ow! Not so hard! Ah! Hey! Th that hurts! How is this a reward? Ah! Oh, stop! I beg of you! Ah! Your, your, your hands are like sharp jaws! It is one open! Ah! You're the devil himself! Episode 18 takes us back to the aftermath, and since our last one, there's been a lot of internal conflict between the hosts. Jeff enters the stage expecting to be accompanied by Bridget, but is instead joined by Blainley, which he is not happy about. Chill out, Jeff. It's not a big deal. All blondes look the same anyway. It's revealed that Blainley apparently, uh, escorted Bridget on a far-reaching expedition to Siberia as a reporter. It's all part of her master plan to take over the Aftermath show and save her own job, I think. The details are a bit murky. The show just bases it all on contractual stuff. The point is, she has separated Jeff from his girlfriend, and he is not happy about that. This Aftermath, like a lot of the others in World Tour, doesn't follow the structure that was established in Total Drama Action. Like, the eliminated contestants this time around aren't even interviewed. At all. Sorry Gwen, sorry Noah, and Tyler. I guess the writers don't care enough about you to give you a proper reflection. They really seem to be playing favorites a lot this season. Instead of the typical reflection in drama, the episode has a whole challenge in it for a few select members of the peanut gallery to get a second chance at winning the million. Five of you rejects are about to capture lightning in a bottle, or in this case, peanuts in a can. <laughs> hey, hey, so Duncan, wow, didn't see that coming. <laughs> The lucky five contestants are randomly selected, and before they start the challenge, Jeff sings a little song for Blainley, and well, it's pretty good. It kinda takes on a whole Russian folksy vibe, and it's basically just him lambasting her. Like, he's berating her so hard. He's just blowing up at her. It's like he's roasting her. Comprehensively. It's a funny song, even if it's not one of my personal favorites. Also, right at the end, Jeff reveals that Blainley's real name isn't Blainley, it's Mildred and it's kind of portrayed as super embarrassing, but honestly, I think Mildred is a perfectly fine name. I dig old lady names. The challenge for a second chance at the show is basically Total Drama Mario Party, or maybe that's what I default to because I never played many board games. Honestly though, I always found this sequence to be a little bit disappointing. I'm usually a fan of these kinds of challenges, but from a writing standpoint, it just doesn't feel super thought through conceptually. The contestants just throw around dice and do a little bit of slapstick. I guess a part of it is that a lot of time is spent on Jeff and Blainley's fighting. Jeff is trying to stall the challenge as long as possible because if the show goes over time, Blainley doesn't get paid. Because of this, Blainley is constantly rushing the whole thing and it really distracts from the challenge's concept. It just feels like what could have been a really entertaining challenge went underutilized. It's not a big deal though. Beth makes it to the end of the competition, but interestingly, she doesn't actually win. She is given a trivia question to answer, but because the show is low on time, Blainly intervenes. What's the name of Duncan's London-based punk band? Come on, Beth, it's easy. Stop pressuring me. I'm thinking. Can I get a hint? Come on, Beth. Just say it's their schnitzel kickers. Their schnitzel kickers is the answer. Say the word what? Ah. Uh, wow. Okay. Um. This uh, really separates the men from the boys. Peter, just say what? Yeah, 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 yeah. Lois, Lois, this is not a race. Sadly for Beth. Because Blainley is the first one to say the answer out loud, she actually wins the whole competition by technicality and is sent over to join the cast of Total Drama. And although I'll be the first to admit it's kind of a silly turn of events, I'd be lying to you if I said I didn't think it was kind of cool. I remember when World Tour was first airing and they advertised two new characters, but once it came out it was revealed that there was a secret third new contestant. She's like an unlockable character in a fighting game. Okay, so episode 19. Most of the episodes of Total Drama World Tour start with some team banter in the airplane, but this episode is a bit different. The campers are being gathered together in the main area while they're asleep. Owen is actually having one of his donut copter dreams, but sadly his fantasy is destroyed by Alejandro and he wakes up with the rest of the cast falling to his death. The campers land in, uh, the Camp Wawanaqua Forest? Wait, no. They're on a river drifting toward Niagara Falls, and if they don't paddle quickly, they're all going to die. If you let us live, I will tutor any If we live, I'll forget she ever said that. If we live, I'll let Sierra kiss me. What? Like we're gonna make it? I want 
Critical fat person cartoon powers have just met their match. Don't worry, Cody. I will restore your breathing and save your life. My breathing is just for the <laughs> wind. No, I can't breathe. The campers make their way from the main falls area to a local casino for the first part of the challenge. Not like the gambling part of the casino, though. They're too young for that. It's the performance hall, and tonight, the campers get to see the famous Blainley Stacy Andrews O'Halloran. Yay! Blainley sings this episode's song in, well, eh. It's not particularly enjoyable as a song, but in the show's defense, that's kind of the point. It's supposed to be unwanted, tacky, and pretty obnoxious to truly capture Blainley as a character. The entire thing exists to establish Blainley's huge ego and contrast it with her decreasing relevance as a television personality. So which one of these lame teams am I on anyway? You're on your own, because as of right now, there are no more teams. Yes! Well, gentlemen, it's been an honor. I trust our brotherhood can continue in some manner. I'm surprised it took so long for this to happen. 19 episodes is quite a lot. Because we're in Niagara Falls, Chris centers the whole challenge around wedding ceremonies, which means all the girls are randomly assigned a male contestant to be their groom. And well, I might complain about the show's relationship stuff a lot in these videos, but this time around, I have nothing to whine about. Basically, every single female contestant is paired up with the best possible male contestant for them in terms of entertainment value. And it is freaking glorious. We get Heather paired with Alejandro, Blainley paired with Owen, Courtney paired with Duncan, and Sierra paired with Cody. Well, actually, Sierra originally rolls Alejandro, but throws a gigantic tantrum and Heather takes him instead. Honestly, this episode is like the holy grail for Sierra moments. She's been a bit less fleshed out these past few episodes, but that quickly ends here. The first half of the couple's challenge is a blindfolded trust test, not totally unlike the ones in season one. There's no serious need for me to go in depth on how the challenge goes, though. It's mostly just comedy, and I don't mean that as a bad thing, because it is really, really funny. It is interesting though, seeing the affinity or lack thereof between some couples. I found it intriguing how well Heather and Alejandro worked together, and the affinity between Blainley and Owen was actually really sweet. The second half of the challenge is walking over Niagara Falls on a tightrope and then trying to get through Canadian customs. I don't really know why they included the second part. I guess because the waterfall is on the border between Canada and the US. It is a pretty fun sequence nonetheless, especially with Sierra, as she hatches a plan to try and marry Cody for real. Here is something Cody doesn't know. I became an ordained minister on the internet. I can marry Cody for real. Oh yeah, I'll recite the ceremony super fast, and all he has to do is say, I do. Do you, Cody, take me Sierra to be your lovely wedding wife? Pardon? For a wedding present, I was thinking about buying you a convertible. Do you like that idea? Sure, but you know this wedding thing is just for the game, right? Is there any other way you'd like to phrase that? Two words. Starts with I. Sadly, despite her many attempts to get Cody to say, I do, word for word, she doesn't manage to do so. Funnily enough, the least enthusiastic couple is the one that wins immunity. Duncan and Courtney are the first ones to reach customs and answer all the questions correctly. Well, you got them all right. Anything to declare? Uh, yes. I declare my husband to be an insensitive jerk who thinks his piercings make him cool when really they just divert attention away from his lack of personality. And I declare wifey here to be a stuck-up windbag. I also declare she could use some mouthwash. <gasps> I want a divorce! Oh, really? Because I want to stay married to your sunshiny self forever. I can't believe the total drama writers would throw something like that away. After the whole challenge, we find Sierra in the confession lamenting her failed proposal, and it cuts to Cody and Alejandro waiting outside to use the bathroom. Oh, sorry. Do you desperately have to go? Uh, yeah, I do. You do? Y you really, really do? <gasps> it's official! That kiss just consummated our marriage! No chance of an omen now, and I do not believe in divorce, okay? So it's looking like death do us part! Is that legal? Does, does that actually work? Any Canadian marriage lawyers here? I don't really know where else to put this in the video, so I thought I might as well talk about it here. 
A common rumor you'll come across in the community is that Sierra was based off of real life fans of the show. And after doing my share of research, I've come to the conclusion that it, well, can't be totally verified, but it probably is true, at least in my opinion. The basic gist is the fact that Cody was and still is a surprisingly popular character. Back in 2009, he had a lot of hugely dedicated fans, despite, well, his time on the show being pretty short. A lot of these fans were also madly in love with the character, and the phenomenon was large enough for Fresh TV to take notice. Or so it goes. I should reiterate that this is just a theory. What makes me personally believe it is an old blog post from the team where they explain the origins of the character Kelsey from Total Drama Action. If you need a refresher, she was the freaky Trent fan with the Trent doll in one of the Aftermath episodes. In the blog post, they refer to her being inspired by a fan named Liana with a doll of a certain character. Cody. Which starts connecting a lot of puzzle pieces. After all, who happens to be the object of Sierra's desire? That's pretty much the only information this is all based off of, but I see it as super likely that after doing the Kelsey scene, the writers were hit with the idea to create a more fleshed out superfan character. When choosing whom she would be in love with, they thought they might as well go for Cody, to pay tribute to the legendary Total Drama fan. But, as I said, that's just a theory. A Total Drama theory! Thanks for watching! Anyway, Alejandro takes advantage of the whole marriage situation. He offers to act as an official witness of the event if Sierra votes with him in the elimination. For whom, you ask? Well, sadly, Owen. I didn't really bring this up, but Alejandro is seen throughout the episode convincing other members to vote with him for Owen, and because of that Big O's fate is sealed. He gets voted off the show, and it's really sad. The reason Alejandro voted for Owen is because of Owen's popularity with the audience, or at least that's what he says. It's been made pretty clear to the audience that Al does not like Owen very much, so it could very well be that. So Owen takes the drop, and plainly is surprisingly sad. I guess arranged marriages on reality TV really bring people together. Wait, no. She was faking it. She was faking it. Our next episode starts with a special bit of attention being given to Blainley. As a means of getting further into the game, she starts asking around for potential allies. Eventually, she turns to Chef, who infamously tried to cheat with DJ last season. He's a bit hesitant at first, but Blainley's special skill in advertising and TV connections wins him over to her villainous schemes pretty quickly. The plane lands in China, and the cast is sent off on their first challenge, a race on the Great Wall. Pretty simple, but there are a few bombs and other Acme Essentials scattered across the racetrack. Also, the campers have to struggle between a variety of different vehicles and means of transportation, some of which are better than others. Alejandro offers to give Duncan the bicycle as a show of good faith. A small price to pay for Duncan's loyalty. What I forgot to mention is that I won a gold medal at the South American Skate Olympics. So wait, is Alejandro South American now? Or is he like a Spaniard competing in regional competitions in other parts of the world. That's confusing. Ever since Sierra and Cody's official unofficial wedding in the last episode, Cody has been trying to find a way to tell her he isn't into her in that way in the best way possible. But it turns out that dumping someone like Sierra is harder than it seems. He tries to do it during the race, but while he's doing it, his donkey kicks her off the wall and she falls into some random Chinese lady's house. The Chinese lady, who I think might be one of like five or six local residents who actually appear in the show, hears her story and offers her a love tea, which apparently is supposed to make Cody fall in love with her. You can see her drinking it a lot throughout the rest of the episode. The first six contestants to make it to the finish line advance on to the next challenge, a special lunch eating quote unquote authentic yeah! Chinese food. And it's basically this season's gross out eating challenge. Though honestly, it's pretty tame. There's way less barf than there was in the brunch of disgustingness in prison food challenges. The food is still pretty gross looking, but it isn't as viscerally awful either. The challenge also comes with a song. Well, kind of. It's not really a continuous track in the way most are. It's basically a musical motif that's repeated as Chris introduces each meal. I've heard some people say they don't like this song, but in its defense, I think it's fine. The verses aren't particularly interesting, but at the very least, the visuals are pretty cool. Anyway, the challenge ends up being more than just a bunch of gross out humor, because, like, Everybody is breaking the rules. Blainly is getting more appetizing looking meals from Chef while everyone else is eating disgusting crap, and sometimes the difference isn't even subtle. Meanwhile, Alejandro is feeding his food to Courtney because he happens to be a picky eater. Like, damn guys, what the hell is with all this cheating? What is this, a Valve official TF2 server? And like a TF2 server, basically nothing is done to stop the problem. Well, to be fair, right at the end, Chris tells everyone to swap dishes and as a result, Sierra wins the challenge. The vote ends up being a tie between Courtney and Blainley, and sadly for them, they both get kicked out without the chance of a tiebreaker. 
And some of you might be thinking I'm gonna get all pouty about this because I like Courtney, but surprisingly, no. All this Gwunkin bullcrap has really just drained me of a lot of my passion. I hate seeing Courtney like this. Ever since the kiss, Courtney has just evolved into a flanderized shadow of her former self, and I just don't want to see any more of her. Literally all of her character traits have been taken away except for her neuroticism and malevolence. Just pull off the freaking band-aid. And Blainley? Well, some people don't like Blainley, but I never really minded her. I think she could have been played down a bit in the season as a whole, but her two episode stint was a funny little break in my personal opinion. Her whole TV hostess diva shtick is honestly quite funny, and there were a few lines in the episode that really stuck with me, especially the ones involving her personal trainers. Not so fast, I have some things to say first. Ezekiel, he's still hiding in the hole. Sierra, Cody has voted for you every single time. Get a clue. <laughs> Heather and Alejandro, just give it up and make out already. Can you get her out of here? I don't know. This part's kind of fun. Oh, you want to hear something really fun? They wanted me to host the show. You only got the job because I said no and... Whoa. The episode finishes off with Sierra and Cody in first class. Sierra makes some more love tea and splashes it all over herself. She then goes to embrace Cody, but something in the tea seems to give him an allergy attack, and this, like, completely incapacitates him. Our next episode opens up with some in-flight banter, like usual. Duncan is in a surprisingly pleasant state of mind after Courtney's elimination, and he pokes fun at Heather and Alejandro's obvious interest in each other. Meanwhile, Sierra is now forcing a semi-comatose Cody to drink the love tea, which, as we just established, gave him an allergy attack. That's gotta be illegal. Like, several years in jail illegal. One thing I notice as I write this is that we are so late in the season, the writers don't even establish how the plane lands anymore. Earlier on, we had scenes dedicated to campers jumping out or falling to their next destination, but now the show is just transitioning to the cast already there. I'm not really saying this is a complaint or anything, by the way, it's just something I found mildly interesting. Our 17th world tour destination is the Serengeti Plains in Tanzania. It's a vast savanna with all sorts of dangerous wild animals, though we don't get to the animals part in the first half of the challenge. What is that noise? Sorry we're late! What's with the cans? Oh, I didn't have time to finish the Just Married banner. <laughs> you like? Very walking dinner bell for lions. You okay in there, Cody? <laughs> Pure poetry guy. I can see married life is treating you well. Due to the temporarily weakened condition of my husband. <laughs> I just love saying that. I'll play for the both of us. Okay, challenge time. The first part is a weirdly convoluted challenge to gather plums and try to break open gourds with a cricket bat or something. Like a lot of other challenges in this season, it's bizarrely complicated for how little time is spent on it. Oh, also, all the other campers try to pummel you with soccer balls. Ooh, pummel by a soccer ball, how painful. Ah! Also, like a lot of other challenges, Heather wins and gets the biggest reward, a few tranquilizer balls. Tranquilizer balls? Do those even exist? Well, regardless of their existence, they likely are going to be very useful in the second part of the challenge, a genuine African safari. And the prey? Well, it's Ezekiel, his skin tinted green and his hair all gone save for a few strands. He also seems to have lost his ability to speak and act like a human being. What the hell, dude? I'll probably talk about this whole Ezekiel thing in depth later in the video, because it only gets weirder from here, but something about how casual everybody is about this random teenager who has completely lost his mind is genuinely unsettling to me. Chris reveals to everyone this beast who used to be a real person they know, and they're all like, oh, that's a little weird. But that's it. Like, where are this guy's parents? Why does no one give a crap about what happened to him? I know he said some mean stuff about women and picked his nose, but like, you know, he's a human being. What the hell? Putting that aside, the challenge is still really good. Alejandro and Duncan team up and Heather ends up joining Sierra and Cody. And this show does not hold back with both its physical comedy and interpersonal scheming. Alejandro steals Heather's trank balls, Heather tries to manipulate Sierra, and some random baboon kidnaps Cody. Amidst the chaos, the four able-bodied members all accidentally shoot each other at once with their trank balls. They all collapse, and Chris sees this as an opportune time to force them to sing. Well, he has to wait like half an hour for them to start waking up. To be fair, I'd have done the same. The song here, Wake Up, is quite good. The lyrics are fine, but what really makes this song shine is the influence of South African music in the instrumental. 
The horns and percussion are especially fun. It's like something right out of Paul Simon's Graceland, which, to be honest, is what they probably took most of their inspiration from. For some reason, after the song, the campers kind of mix alliances a bit. Heather and Alejandro team up against Duncan, and Duncan tries and fails to team up with Sierra. She's a bit too, um, focused on Cody to want to work with anyone else. She goes off to find Cody and finds him being given a foot massage by the same monkey who stole him. She challenges the monkey, the monkey summons his or her friends, and they do battle. Of course, Sierra, with the true power of love and groupieism, overcomes the monkeys and takes her prize. Oh, to be fought over by a viciously tall girl and a pack of wild animals who are both enamored with you. Cody truly is living the life. The challenge ends when Heather and Alejandro enact their villainous plan on poor Duncan. They trim him into a bush of Serengeti blood berries, which, like Trank Balls, aren't actually real things, and the smell of blood all over Duncan soon lures Zeke. Alejandro uses Duncan as bait, tranquilizes Zeke, and wins the challenge, and he shares an impulsive hug with Heather before they both realize what they just did. Aww, they like each other! The cast quickly boards the plane and takes flight, but Zeke of course stows away just in time for later. In today's lucky loser is Duncan, thanks to Heather and Al's new alliance. It's a little sad, but for what it's worth, Duncan's high placement overall makes him one of the best performing contestants in the show's history, which is pretty cool. Alejandro invites Cody up with him in first class, much to the surprise of everybody else. Now that I know Heather can be persuaded, it's time to focus on breaking the bonds of Sierra's and Cody's matrimony. That rat! I think agreed to an alliance and this is how he repays me? He is so going down! It really is a constant back and forth between them. You know Spy vs. Spy? It's like that. We're down to our final four. Alejandro, Heather, Sierra, and Cody. And they are quite the bunch. Overnight, Alejandro has been working to befriend Cody, and in response, Heather has been trying to ease up to Sierra. After all, an extra vote at this point in the game is essential. Between me and Cody Wody and the Heather Alejandro love fest, this plane is starting to feel like one huge double date in a can. Well... Except for Chris and Chef. Chef isn't really Chris's type. Boo! Boo! Chris and Chef are made for each other! The plane lands in our next challenge location, Rapa Nui, more well known as Easter Island. The camper's first challenge is finding three eggs of a certain color amidst a bunch of seemingly familiar statues and safely taking them up to the highest point on the island. It's a pretty basic task, and that gives the writers time to flesh out our final four and their social strategies to get through the game. <gasps> Got one! Blue's my color. Thank you, Sierra. You were so kind to me. Oops! I guess that's what happens when you're a home-wrecking husband stealer and destroyer of dreams! I gotta say, the decision to include a bunch of statues of previous contestants might seem a bit arbitrary, but the show uses it as an opportunity for a bit of reflection on everything that's happened so far in this season. It reminds me of the totem pole challenge from season 1, and that's not a bad thing. What's also not a bad thing is Sierra in this episode. In fact, she is freaking hilarious! The fact that they're collecting eggs in this challenge serves as the basis for Sierra to start acting like she and Cody have had kids together. And it's wonderful. At one point, one of Sierra's eggs hatches, and she starts treating it like her son. He even looks like Cody! And to add to all of that, the hatchling is obsessed with Heather for some reason. It's just... it's just everything I could ask for. Alejandro is the first one to make it to the top, and he gets a huge advantage in the next part of the challenge, returning the eggs they found to the gigantic vicious condor they stole it from. Yeah. But hey, we get a good song out of it. The Final Four sing Condor, a lovely little tune with a spicy flamenco flavor. I like it a lot. I, oh I, I've got problems with Condor, problems with Condor. Why, oh why, am I not at home? I ponder. Holy shit! Cody sang! Oh my god! Yes! It finally happened! He did it! I'm so proud of him! He sang! He sang! Let's do it! And give it up for Cody! Oh my god! Yes! Yes! That 
was freaking amazing! I have received so many demos and so many albums of people sending me them singing and it sounds like freaking crap and then freaking Cody comes out of freaking nowhere and he's able to sing beautifully, he's projecting his voice, it sounds fantastic, every single note is perfectly on pitch, it is a mind-blowing phenomenon that Cody is able to sing so beautifully and I of course my mind is blown and of course I'm excited that Cody has demonstrated to the world that he is a fantastic singer. This is honestly blowing my mind. I never in a million years thought that we would get to hear Cody sing. And then, and then what does the show do? What does the show do? Proves me wrong in the last second. And I couldn't be happier, baby. We live in a world where we get to see and hear Cody sing. This is genuinely one of the best songs in the show. Every single character has a verse and each one rocks. It's like one of the only songs of this kind too. The melody is great, the lyrics are great, the instrumental is great, and the singing too is surprisingly great. Like, man, they really should have had Cody sing more often because he genuinely has a good voice. All in all, it's a stupendous song. Heather wins the challenge, but right after she takes victory, Cody Jr. flies back to her and that really makes the Condor furious. The Condor turns around and sends Heather flying, and she bumps into one of the Moai statues and causes a huge domino effect. Literally. The voting takes place, and three out of the four members vote for Sierra. But right after Cody cheers for her departure, Chris reveals it was a fake out and no one is getting voted off. Awkward. Heather shows understandable frustration about all of this, but after rethinking, she uses this to her advantage. She takes Alejandro up to first class in order to give Sierra and Cody some alone time together, but she is not doing it to be with Alejandro. Interesting choice. I'll pray for you, amigo. Just to be clear, you will be together in economy. I am flying first class. As I gather, so am I. Do not get any ideas. This is strictly strategic. Hmm. Episode 23 starts off a little different than usual. We see a point of view shot of Alejandro sneaking around Chris's personal quarters. He makes his way to Chris's laptop, logs in, and looks at the security footage. He clicks on Sierra, deleting her, and effortlessly drags Heather over to make it look like she's cuddling with Cody. You know, because that's definitely how Photoshop works. He presses the print button on the keyboard, because that apparently exists, and prints out the picture, presumably to turn Sierra against Heather. Right after this little scene, we cut to the typical pre-challenge plane banter most episodes start on. Of course I'll marry you, Gwen. Sierra? Oh, she had quite a bad roller skating accident. Don't worry your pretty head about- ah! What are you doing? You were having a terrible nightmare! <laughs> Cody is woken up by Sierra and displays genuine fear. He voted for her last episode and is expecting her to lash out against him in some way. However, Sierra seems to be in a genuinely great mood. She says that she's planning a big surprise for him because it's the best day of the year. If you were expecting Alejandro to save his photoshopped masterpiece for later, you'd be incorrect. Right after the scene between Sierra and Cody, he reveals it to her, completely shifting her intentions for the episode. Because she's pissed. Alejandro encourages her to keep it silent though, and wait for the right time to directly retaliate against Heather. But upon thinking about it, I think he only really says that because only Sierra really is as deluded and paranoid to believe that Heather would willingly leave first class and snuggle with Cody overnight. Sierra manages to keep herself from bringing the topic up with Heather head on, but isn't able to stop herself from unleashing her fiery rage. The plane lands in Drumheller, Alberta, which, like Newfoundland, I only really know exists because of this TV show. The Final Four's first challenge is to create their own dinosaur out of whatever fossils and bones they can come across nearby. It makes for a fun bit, but the writers don't actually spend much time on the challenge aspect of it. It's never really covered how the bones are found, and most of it is just dedicated to the interplayer drama. Sierra's pure hysteria is engrossing to me. I wish I could just show all the lines she says here, but this video is already long enough. So instead I'll remind you that these videos shouldn't be seen as a replacement for the source material, and there are dozens of hilarious jokes that I don't actually cover, so you should totally see the show for yourself if you haven't. After a while, the teens finish their dinosaurs and exhibit them. Alejandro recreates a perfect Allosaurus, which impresses pretty much everyone. Wow, I'm Alejandro and I can rebuild entire dinosaur skeletons from memory. I'm so cool. Shut up, nerd. 
Heather creates a gigantic Chris McLean dino, which is a reasonable play given how often sucking up tends to yield good results in these challenges. Cody creates the Codiodon, which is just a bunch of coprolite fossils strewn together. So not only does it look more like a dog than a dinosaur, it's also literally made of shit. The last dinosaur, and my personal favorite, is Sierra's. Meet the broken Hardosaurus, a tribute to all those who have been betrayed by those they love. Why is it wearing a party hat? Because it's your birthday! It's my birthday? It's my birthday! I totally forgot! I could never, ever forget your birthday! Heather, did you remember it was his birthday? Remember his birthday? Twerp is lucky I remember his name. Honestly though, this has me a little bit confused. There's a line in the first episode of the season where Sierra mentions Cody's birthday being the 1st of April. So that would mean this episode takes place on that date. But that leaves me wondering, don't these kids have like school or something? We don't know their ages at this point, but we do know that they were all 16 in Total Drama Island. Total Drama Island is said to have taken place over eight weeks in the summer, and Total Drama Action takes place right after over six weeks. But it's not said how much time passed between Action and World Tour. The Celebrity Manhunt special seems to imply that it's been at least a while, but we don't get any definite numbers. For the sake of argument, if Island started in June of 2008, then it likely ended in August of the same year. Then, Action would have taken place until around September or October, depending on how far into August it started. Since episode 23 of World Tour is confirmed to take place on April 1st, I think it can be reasonably assumed that the season started in February. But which February? It all really depends on how long of a break took place between Action and World Tour. But we don't really know. If it was February of 2009, that would mean all this stuff that happened between seasons 2 and 3 took place in like 4 months, which seems a bit absurd. So maybe it's been 16 months since Action, and Cody is now turning 18? Maybe. I don't know. None of this is really a big deal, but honestly I remember trying to work it out in my head as a kid, so I felt like I should bring it up here. I guess the only thing we can know for sure is that I'm a loser, because I'm the one analyzing the temporal consistency of a children's cartoon. Cody displays genuine gratitude at Sierra remembering his birthday, and it's really sweet seeing him like that. Anyway, to judge the dinosaurs, Chris hooks up all the campers to a lie detector to ask them what they honestly believe was the best dinosaur of the bunch. And if you thought that the lie detector scene in Total Drama Actions episode 18 was good, you're going to love this. The sequence is hilarious and the dialogue is fantastic. I think my favorite part is Alejandro and Heather trying to vote for Cody to gain his trust, but then admitting that their favorite was Sierra's because they found her display of raw emotion to be really touching. That's just... That's just right up my sense of humor, I guess. Sierra wins the first half of the challenge, and her prize is a post digger, which will prove useful both in impaling Heather and digging up oil barrels for the next part of the challenge. Heather wins a prospector's kit and pickaxe for getting in second place. Cody wins a sandcastle kit for getting third, and Alejandro gets nothing, even though he tied with Cody. I don't really know why. Cody tries to approach Sierra about all her weird hostility and comes across the picture she got from Alejandro. He displays confusion, but eventually finds a way to explain to Sierra what might have happened. Wait, this is just me and Heather alone in loser class. Oh, oh gosh. I told myself I wasn't going to cry, but... No, Sierra, don't cry. That proves it's a fake. When do you ever leave me by myself? Well, I let you go to the bathroom all the time. The fact that Sierra was not present in this photo convinces her that the photo was faked and the two make amends. Right after, Sierra finds a barrel, and she and Cody split up, agreeing to vote against Alejandro if they can. While Alejandro is desperately digging with his two hands, Heather takes some time to taunt him, causing him to react with extreme hostility. Like, usually he is good at keeping his cool, but not here. Heather goes off and does some digging of her own, and comes across some oil. However, a catapulted boulder flies in her direction, trapping her in one of the holes she dug because Chris and Chef are catapulting boulders at the contestants during all of this. I didn't really mention that. Alejandro comes across Heather stuck under the boulder, and can't help but mock her a bit. And this leads into the Total Drama World Tour song to end all Total Drama World Tour songs. Not literally though, we still have a few more songs to talk about later. This is how we will end it is unreal. It's a power ballad duet between two of the show's most diabolical villains, and everything about it is wonderful. It's like the Be Prepared of Total Drama, and trust me, that's an honorable title. Well, at least for the first half, because Heather actually is able to talk through Alejandro's villainous boasting and convinces him to help her out of the ditch in exchange for agreeing to not vote for him, which, gotta say Al, might have not been the best strategic decision.
I did not let my feelings get in the way of the game. It's just that I changed my mind. Got it? It's all strategic. Because Sierra was the first to bring her barrel to the plane, she wins invincibility. The other three are at the mercy of each other. The cast votes at a recreation of the island elimination bonfire, and Chris begins to read out the ballots. Let's read the remaining votes, just for a little suspenseful fun. The first vote goes to Cody. One for Alejandro. Another one for Alejandro. And the last vote goes to... Wait, we've all been through a lot together, so I think we should do one last thing before anybody gets the boot. BRB! Happy birthday, Cody! I made it myself. Sierra, look yeah. out! Sierra blows up the entire plane and also her hair is burnt off. Chris, characteristically, is much more concerned about the plane. Ah, uh, she's fine. Although I guess with the whole blowing up my plane business, she's out of the game! I gotta say, Christian Potenza did a really good job with that line. That's some palpable anger. Heather quickly retreats the situation to burn the votes because, well, she obviously voted for Alejandro, but Alejandro retrieves them in time before they're totally destroyed and finds out for sure that she did not keep her end of the promise. That was dumb of you, Al. I'm just saying. It's like the Prisoner's Dilemma, or the Ambidex game. You chose to ally with someone who was absolutely gonna betray you. With all said and done though, yeah, this episode is fantastic. It never really stood out to me much at first, but upon thinking about all of its moments and bits, it's probably one of my favorites of the whole season. There are just so many things I love about it. Episode 24 is upon us, and that means we're about to have another Aftermath episode. But this time around, we're not going to be in the usual studio. The entire gang has made their way to Hawaii, the final location for the show. It's a nice change of scenery. This episode basically serves as a recap for the season, covering the actions of the final three and whom everybody is cheering on. Our eliminated contestants do show up, but they are almost entirely ignored, except for Blainley, who appears to be, well, slightly injured. What did you do to the mean blonde person? Wasn't me. Don't you remember when Courtney and Blainley got booted out of the plane together in China? Get a load of what happened next in this previously unseen footage. And boom! <laughs> <laughs> um, am I supposed to find that funny? Like, I know Blainley is kind of a B-I-T-C, but everyone laughing at her covered in bandages being moved around on a dolly comes off as really sadistic. What did she even do? The worst thing I can think of is what she did to Bridget. But even then, I don't see the injuries as particularly justified, and the fact that everyone is laughing at her expense comes off as uncomfortably out of character. Speaking of Bridget, she's finally back with the gang, and she has befriended an injured bear she met in Siberia. Sadly for Jeff, the bear is really overprotective, and doesn't let Jeff get anywhere near her. Other than that though, the bear is adorable. Our first song is Who You Gonna Root For, and it's alright. I like the whole island vibe, and the hook is nice. It's a nice way to present the inquiry of whom we as the audience should be rooting for in the final three. The song goes haywire though, and Harold starts dropping bars about Cody, and then Courtney steals the mic and starts singing badly about how much she hates Gwen and Duncan. Yeah, it's a little silly. Here's where it gets interesting. It's time to vote for your favorite finalists. What can I say? She's a really good character. Also, I find it funny that Tyler continues to root for Alejandro even though he openly blames Al for his elimination earlier in the episode. I guess they just have a strong bond that transcends petty competition. Blainley gets added to Team Heather because literally no one else wants to root for her, but Bridget eventually forces a few Cody supporters to work for Heather for the sake of the challenge. One member from each team has to surf down a waterfall and successfully dress their finalist spirit animal with a lei. They also have to avoid lava spray, because this is happening right next to an active volcano. Ouch. Harold volunteers for Team Cody, Courtney volunteers for Team Alejandro, and Blainley is forced to play for Team Heather. You know, even though she's immobile right now. 
Owen steps up to help her, but all he really does is surf her and repeatedly get her hurt. You know, I really hate to go all early 2010s cartoon critic on you guys, but I kind of find the treatment of Blaine in this episode to be needlessly cruel. I mean, the fact that she keeps getting further injured due to Owen's incompetence is one thing, but what really gets to me is how all the people around her just do not care about the whole situation they're willingly putting her in. The scene where everybody else in Team Heather knowingly takes a step back so they can force Blaine to do the challenge comes off as really dark. And I'm not necessarily against dark comedy, but Total Drama as a show has always portrayed most of its characters as relatively down to earth. I could imagine Chris McLean being like this, but seeing characters like Jeff, Bridget, and Lashana giggle and take advantage of Blaine in this state is a little much for me. It just comes off as excessively mean-spirited and unfitting for the tone the show has set so far. I'm not going to dwell on this though, mostly because this won't be the last time this topic enters the discussion. The four volunteers retrieve their lays, and suddenly a familiar bell sound and icon shows up. They have to sing. Finally! Duncan never uses soap, and Gwen's so lame, there's just no ho 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 Not that song! So is that all this amounts to? Three seasons of a genuinely fascinating dynamic between two characters reduced to just another gag? Let's just finish up this episode, but I'll get back to this. After Courtney does her little shtick, she, Harold, and Owen sing a song as they surf down the stream. And for what it's worth, it's pretty good. I like the guitar, I like the melody, and although I just complained about how Blaine is being treated, I found Owen's lyrics while writing her to be pretty funny. Anyway, Courtney wins the challenge for Alejandro, meaning he will get a major advantage in the finale. A wheelbarrow! And Cody gets a baby stroller! Okay, now that the episode is done, we can talk about the elephant in the room. Gwonkin. One thing that was hanging over me while writing this entire video is when and how I will write about the whole Duncan cheating on Courtney thing. The topic was obviously really important for me to cover, and I have a decent amount to say about it, but the problem was I wasn't sure where to put it here. Earlier on in this video, I certainly demonstrated disdain at the whole kiss and the touch and go drama following it, but I only really gave it passing comments. That's because I felt like it would be important to talk about the breakup and new relationship with all of it in mind. And going in depth right when the kiss takes place would be leaving out a lot of the whole picture. However, this is basically where all the Gwunkin Dunkney stuff comes to an end this season. Well, there's also a bonus clip with Courtney where the same singing joke is basically repeated and Duncan and Gwen throw a flip flop at her and then kiss. But most of you probably haven't seen that and it really just makes things worse. I was asked by a lot of people to talk about Gwunkin. It's a very important topic to a lot of people, and it's pretty obvious why. Courtney and Duncan are two of the most popular characters in the show, and their relationship was beloved. So I think it's pretty safe to say that breaking them up, if nothing else, was going to elicit some strong opinions. But before I rip and tear Doomguy style into the whole thing, there is one thing I have to say. <sighs> you guys want to know a secret? You sure? Okay. I don't think Duncan kissing Gwen was such a bad idea. And when I say that, I don't mean that I don't have any problems with Gwunkin. What I am specifically saying is that Duncan cheating on Courtney as a plot point is not necessarily that bad. Because listen, as much as I do love Duncan and Courtney as a couple, I don't see it as too beyond the pale for Duncan to have an interest in Gwen. The two have always had a friendship, and although I think that season 3 somewhat unnaturally raised the heat between them, I don't find it ridiculous. It's not like what happened between Trent and Gwen, where Trent completely changes his behavior into an obsessive lunatic for seemingly no reason. That was really bad writing. Duncan kissing Gwen, by comparison, is not anywhere near as absurd. Where the issue arises, for me personally, is that Duncan kissing Gwen causes a whole host of interesting problems that never get satisfyingly resolved. You might think that Courtney's heartbreak and Gwen's guilt would be interesting topics to dwell on for a while. If you do, well, it appears that the writers disagree, because almost all of the Gwunkin stuff lasts four episodes until Gwen takes the drop of shame. It's almost kind of funny, because I would say the attention the writers give the conflict in the season as a whole is really unsatisfying to both Dunkney fans and Gwunkin fans. If you're a Dunkney fan, the reasoning is pretty obvious, but Gwunkin fans don't really get much either. After the kiss, the two of them genuinely talk only a handful of times, and usually it's just a passing remark. 
Gwen gets voted out so quickly that it's almost as if the writers were trying to get it all over with as fast as possible. Like, they never even wanted this in the first place. Well, actually, there is credence to my observation there. And for those of you who watched my action video, apologies in advance, but I'm gonna have to repeat myself a bit here. A lot of people think that Duncan and Courtney were broken up as a network request from Teletoon. And, well, they're actually correct. There's an old Q&A video from 2012 with Christian Potenza and Tom McGillis, where they talk about certain behind the scenes decisions surrounding the show. And Tom actually says this. He said that on behalf of Teletoon, one of the production executives told him that they shouldn't try and make the couples in the show too seriously engaged, as they are all teenagers and it would likely foster a bad image of love and relationships for younger audiences if the show wrote all the couples as if they were matches made in heaven. After all, to quote Tom, most people don't marry the person that they started dating when they were 16. To be fair, he's not wrong. But come on, Tom. Did you have to pick Duncan and Courtney? Come on. He also states in the video that he had no real strong opinion on Duncan getting with Gwen, and it was a writing room decision he didn't really push one way or the other. And you know what? In retrospect, this makes a lot of sense. Because so much of the whole love triangle arc feels like the writers were asked to do something they didn't really want to do, and just went, ugh, fine. As I said, Gwen takes the drop like two episodes after being found out, and then the whole mutual hatred between Duncan and Courtney is reduced to just kind of a joke. And it's not a particularly good joke in my opinion. Except the wedding episode. For all the problems with Gwen and Trent's breakup last season, at the very least, they were willing to give it a decent amount of attention to be meaningfully resolved. There's more than enough time spent on both characters finding peace after the breakup and even being able to become friends again. Duncan and Courtney don't get that luxury. Remember the boathouse scene in season one? It's a scene where Duncan and Courtney have one of their first genuinely upfront discussions. And because of that, it's one of my personal favorites in the whole show. It's a scene where the show isn't afraid to tone down the comedy and focus on the character relationships and development. When you compare the boathouse scene to Courtney singing about Duncan not using soap and Gwen being so lame that there's no hope, the difference becomes striking. The only emotional vulnerability displayed surrounding the breakup is done for comedic purposes, and it usually involves Courtney throwing an excessive tantrum or kicking Duncan in the Kiwis. This is actually a phenomenon that can be seen in general. It really seems that after season one, the show pretty much cut out all attempts at character interaction played for anything other than comedy, and that really stings to me. Total Drama Island was so special to me because it did more than just be funny. There were moments of genuinely engaging teen drama, but that stuff becomes less and less common as the season number increases. I should say though that pretty much all of this discussion about what might have been planned and what could have happened and why they did certain things all comes from this one YouTube video. Because of that, I highly recommend you guys watch the video on your own and make your own conclusions. If there's one thing I've learned from over 2,000 comments on my Total Drama Iceberg video, it's that people have a bad habit of parroting blatantly false rumors and then not having any sources to back it up. You know what I wish happened? I could honestly live with Duncan kissing Gwen. As I said, the two characters have always gotten along, and them being romantically interested in each other isn't a stretch. I would have loved for Duncan to have seen the error of his ways and try to rectify things with Courtney. We could have had a boathouse style scene where they both admit their mistakes and stuff, and if nothing else, it would have at least tried to address the whole thing seriously. Obviously that's kind of my dream world scenario, but even if they didn't get back together, I wish the writers at least gave the characters time to display genuine emotion uninterrupted by jokes. The whole thing so quickly dissolves into Duncan and Gwen being a relatively casual, easy talking couple, and Courtney being a crazy, vindictive psycho, and before you know it, it's over. Well, to be fair, I guess there's always next season, right? Before I finally end this stupid rant, I just wanted to display a quick anecdote. Out of curiosity, I decided to watch a handful of episodes from the infamous Total Drama Rama. And one thing I found interesting is that the back and forth between Duncan and Courtney is back to its season one vibe. That old odd couple dynamic comes back in full force, and it's super refreshing. There's genuinely a good argument that Courtney is better characterized in Total Drama Rama than she is in World Tour and All Stars. I know a lot of people don't like the show because they're all four years old and stuff, but at the very least, they have one thing down right. Anyway, I could go on and on about all this Gwunkin crap, but I think we found a decent stopping point. So I'll leave it at this. 
I personally dislike the direction the writers took with the characters Duncan, Gwen, and Courtney in this season. Yeah, I know. Riveting. Episode 25 opens up the morning after episode 23, with the cast stranded in Drumheller. Chris is obviously in shock at the destruction of his plane, and continuously complains about the whole thing. It's a little silly to see him suddenly so worried about the thing, though, given how much he abused it throughout the season, but whatever. Even though Sierra was eliminated last episode, she still is with everybody. After all, they are in the middle of nowhere, and she's also seriously injured. Now that Sierra's out of the game, it would be nice to earn points with Cody. But really, I have to help. I've been where she is. Crazy or not, no girl should ever have to be bald on national TV. Here, maybe these will help. Does it look okay? Gorgeous. Maybe this is just me being a fanboy, but I really like this gesture of Heather's. It's always nice seeing her when she's actually compelled to do something kind to others. It gives us insight into who she is past her rough exterior. Pretty conveniently, Chef comes across Chris's emergency kit, which contains a helicopter, some walkie-talkies, and some GPSs. Chris's mood does a total 180, and he excitedly tells the remaining contestants that they're about to take a trip to Hawaii. The cast initially thinks they're going to ride in the chopper, but they find out Chris and Chef are leaving them there. The three of them have to find their way out of Drumheller on their own. Their first objective is to somehow make their way to Tijuana Beach in Mexico for the next part of the race. Cody and Sierra decide to rummage through the plane's scraps to look for anything useful, while Heather and Alejandro argue and go off on their own. And you know, for all this show's postulating about the futility of the campers being stuck in the middle of Alberta, everybody finds their way out of it pretty quickly. In seemingly no time at all, Alejandro stows away on a truck being used to transport some of the show's animals, and Heather conveniently finds train tracks and boards a train which by pure coincidence is going to Mexico. Cody and Sierra build the mechanism for a makeshift hot air balloon, but they are confronted with the problem of not having a basket. Sierra offers her wheelchair and tells Cody to leave her in the desert, but he declines the offer and insists that he sit on her lap. After all, Cody has grown to develop a real liking for Sierra and now treasures her as a close friend. Honestly, in my opinion, it's a really sweet scene. I know some people don't like the whole Codera thing, but I adore it, and I think the two of them are great together in this episode. We've had a lot of coincidences in this episode, and the string of totally unrelated happenstances is not ending anytime soon, because the truck Alejandro entered earlier on in the episode actually unloads all of its cargo in the same exact train Heather is riding. Convenient! He comes across a box with Ezekiel in it, and offers to let him out out of sympathy. But when he makes his way to the passenger cart, he sees Heather and unleashes the Zeke on her. She makes a run for it, but Alejandro is quick on the pursuit. Eventually, the two of them find themselves on the top of the train, and it's a pretty badass shot. Hey, hey, you know what this reminds me of? Chapter 6 of Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door In order to sabotage Heather, Alejandro uses his belt to detach the train car she is on. Which, I get that Alejandro wants the mill, but I'm pretty sure that's a felony. And it was all for naught as Heather quickly makes it back to the main part of the train. Right as Heather and Al make their way on the top of the same cart, Chris's helicopter, which conveniently appears to be taking the exact same route as the train, shows up and tells them to sing. I pride myself on my timing. Are you kidding me? You know the answer to that by now. You'd think everybody would be a considerable distance from each other given how far the trek is, but okay. I gotta say though, I'm gonna make it is a borderline masterpiece. It's a Heartland Rock banger that has all three of our contestants plus Sierra singing about their plans to win and overcome their hardships. And pretty much every single part is awesome. The back and forth between Alejandro and Heather dancing on the train is awesome both visually and lyrically, and the singing between Cody and Sierra is adorable. Sierra's voice actress does an especially stellar job on the chorus, but everyone here honestly sings great. So yeah, I love this song. And I might regret saying this here, but I think it genuinely is my favorite song in the whole show. I remember listening to it over and over as a kid because I just couldn't get enough of the chorus. During and after the song, all three contestants are given new problems to deal with. Heather takes the lead, but is unhappy to find out that she is sharing a ride with Zeke. Alejandro gets tossed off the train, but he comes across some Mustang horses and rides them back. Cody and Sierra crash into a power line, and their entire hot air balloon is destroyed. Cody, feeling defeated by the whole situation, then gives up. But Sierra has other plans. She makes her way to a local fireworks shop and asks the guy there if he could help them out. 
He resists at first, until he finds out that she's trying to help Cody win the current Total Drama season, and he immediately gives in and donates a bunch of fireworks to the cause. Ugh. Get up! Why? Face the facts, it's over. You want a number one fan, mister? That comes with responsibilities. You can't let me and the rest of your fan base down like this. The blogosphere will never let you hear the end of it. So come on already. You really think I can do it? I know you can. Now get up. You're right. <laughs> Little help. I'm going to be honest. I really, really like that scene. Heather gets knocked out of the train by Zeke and lands on one of the horses being led by Al, and the two of them make their way to the finish line. Meanwhile, Cody and Sierra launch themselves into the air with all the fireworks they got and land conveniently right on the boats Chris set up on Tijuana Beach. Those are some crazy odds. All three parties ride over to Hawaii neck and neck, and within a minute, Heather is the first to arrive. Uh, are the riders aware that the distance between Hawaii and Tijuana Beach is like 4,000 kilometers? I hate to be such a stickler, but it is ridiculous how this scene is portrayed. The entire race from Mexico to Hawaii is just over a minute of the episode, and there's no indication of any real passage of time. In fact, there's no real evidence that this episode takes place in anything more than a couple of hours, despite the fact that a real-life train ride and boat ride from Alberta to Hawaii would be at the very least several days, and that's a really generous estimate. Regardless, Cody almost makes second place, but Alejandro rides over a mine and that sends him flying, so they both tie for silver, and the episode pretty much ends there. Okay, so this episode is genuinely fantastic. I know I made fun of how some parts are ridiculously contrived, but that's not really a big deal. And honestly, trying to realistically portray a race crossing a 5,000 kilometer distance between three countries in a matter of 20 minutes is effectively impossible. Even though it's a little bit silly how everyone somehow stays neck and neck despite the long distance, the grand sense of adventure in this episode is palpable and more than makes up for the inconsistencies. It's a very unique episode too. Maybe I'm just a sucker for trains, but no other episode of Total Drama up to this point has this feeling of movement, of transition, and that makes it really special to me. The character interactions here are also, in my opinion, top notch. Heather and Alejandro's biting rivalry after numerous betrayals and the genuine bond between Cody and Sierra really stick with me. I've loved this episode ever since I was a kid, and I don't see it stopping anytime soon. <laughs> Finale time! Our remaining three contestants go into an island confessional to record their thoughts. I only let Heather beat me to give her a false sense of confidence, but how will I explain to those at home that I tied with that pathetic Cody? Oh, my brother Jose will be compiling his insults already. Hmm, what's that I hear? Some last minute character exposition? You never mentioned you had a brother. Jose, was it? He's not worth mentioning. Wait, what? Did Heather watch the confessional that Alejandro just did or something? Or did he just mention it to the others off screen? Whatever. Heather takes on the burden of choosing the tiebreaker, and the way she chooses it is stepping into one of those weird booth things and being pummeled by golf balls. It's like the Ticket Blaster from Chuck E. Cheese, except, you know, golf balls. Heather accidentally swallows a golf ball and coughs it up, which is picked up by Jeff and then read out loud. Ew. Heather has selected the traditional Hawaiian fire dance of death. I question how traditional it is for a male warrior to wear a coconut bra. Forget that! Someone get me off of this thing! <laughs> she's funny when she's tied up and can't hurt me. That's funny. Alejandro and Cody basically have to knock each other off the wooden platform in order to win. Also, there are sharks in fire. Really fitting for a final challenge, I guess. Surprisingly, despite the epic setup, the challenge does not last very long. Wait, actually, it's Alejandro versus Cody. I don't think anyone was expecting it to take a while. To add insult to injury, as Heather's pole starts burning, she intentionally sabotages Cody by telling him that Sierra is in danger and that pretty much seals the deal for the Codester. Alejandro uses that second to knock him off the wood to be eaten in the shark-infested water. Luckily for him, being crippled doesn't stop Sierra from doing anything to save her husband. He's still eliminated, though. So, Alejandro and Heather is the final two. I gotta say, that's a pretty unique choice. This is the first time a seasoned antagonist has been a finalist. Because of that, the stakes here are a lot higher than normal. For comparison, look at the finale for season one. Gwen and Owen allied against Heather to get into the final two, and after that they were cruising, 
but this time around, it's not going to be a friendly fun competition between two fun friends where one friend is guaranteed 50 grand anyway because they cut a deal. It's going to be a dangerous, deadly game between angry enemies where everyone hates each other. And that has its benefits. The challenge ahead has three main steps. The first is creating a dummy out of driftwood and pineapples that resembles the other contestant. Next, you have to take the dummy up a long trek to the top of an active volcano. Finally, you need to throw your dummy in the magma and hopefully not die of a heat stroke. Also, you can enlist two former contestants to help you. Alejandro gets help from Courtney and Lindsay. And Heather, well... Any enthusiasm for me? Alejandro is going down! Nobody makes shark bait out of me and gets away with it. Anyway, Heather was pretty good to me overall. Hey, I bet I'm the first person to ever say that. Um, you do realize she just willingly sabotaged you like two minutes ago, right Cody? Harold decides to help Heather as well as a symbolic gesture to Cody's righteousness, which is very kind of him. I suppose lanky white guys have to stick together after all. The first part of the challenge is accompanied by our final song in the season, Versus. And it's good. It's good. It's not personally one of my favorites, but I still like it. For me, the strong suit here is the lyrics. I find the cheeky back and forth between Heather and Alejandro to be really enjoyable. The chorus is really catchy too. On the other hand though, I'm not super keen on the vocals. Most of the singing here is pretty monotone, and sometimes they're basically just talking. I suppose that kind of fits in with the whole stripped back auto-tune electropop thing they have going here, but it just doesn't do too much for me. Also, this is just a nitpick, but I will admit that it irks me a tiny bit that a lot of the quote-unquote mythological imagery here takes way more inspiration from Greek culture than it does Hawaiian, with all the lightning and laurel wreaths. That's not a big deal though, but there is one big issue. Um, well, Cody doesn't sing. Alejandro is the first to finish his dummy, but Heather is quick to follow him. Before the two set off on their trek, Chris gives Alejandro the wheelbarrow his team won two episodes ago. Heather's team didn't win anything, but Heather convinces Chris to let her use Cody's stroller, only to be struck with disappointment when it immediately collapses. Alejandro and Heather make their way up to a major obstacle, a Mario level. Well, actually, it's a river of lava with a bunch of stepping stones in between. But perhaps due to early childhood programming, any instance of lava with stones one has to jump between immediately makes me think of Mario. I swear, I'm half expecting Bowser to be waiting up at the top. I gotta say though, this seems ridiculously dangerous. The fact that these are teenagers being made to jump over lava is one thing, but the traps, Chris? Come on! The traps are only set off if the helpers cut certain ropes with these giant machetes, but you'd have to be a psychopath to even willingly touch those things. Like, I'm all for good TV, but I wouldn't want to kill anyone. Plus, that would probably be a murder charge. Or, at least manslaughter. Does knowingly activating a deadly trap directed at someone count as premeditated murder? Any criminal law experts from Hawaii in the audience? Perhaps it is time to admit you're outclassed. Quit now, maybe I'll throw you some pity cash. <laughs> no way, Jose. What? What did you just say? Never call me that again. Whoa, testy much? Jose always has to win. Always. Whoa, Al. Chill out, bro. What happened to the charming, nondescript Hispanic guy we've gotten used to? He lives to make me miserable. He punches me in the arm and calls me Al just because I hate it. Al hates being called Al? Gosh, Al. Owen must have called Al, Al, like a thousand times. Huh, Al? <laughs> Poor Al. Look at that subtle off-white coloring. The tasteful thickness of it. Oh my God. It even has a watermark. Cody distracts Alejandro and gives Heather time to take the lead. He quickly activates a trap, but it accidentally traps the wrong person. Alejandro goes on ahead, leaving Heather caged all alone in lethal lava land, or Grumble Volcano. Come on, Heather! Are you just gonna let him win a million bucks? Hurry! There's no time to lose! Uh... Don't give up or the bad guy wins! You mean, I'm the good guy? Uh... Can I just say that I really, really like the way Heather is characterized in this season? All I can say is, stay tuned for the tier list video. We cut to the top of the volcano, with Chris, Chef, and the rest of the cast all waiting for the final two. Alejandro makes his way up first. Looking for this? Thanks for everything. 
That's one for the thumbnail of a video I made last year. I actually had to redraw it in Clip Studio Paint because there's no HD version of the frame I could find. Alejandro makes his way over to the crater and almost throws it in, but Heather quickly interrupts him and goes off. Oh, I worked so hard, and now you're just gonna take the mill and vanish from my life forever. Oh, just throw your stupid doll in the stupid volcano already. So, what are you more upset about losing? The million or me? Are you cracked? I would never fall for a jerk like you. Then why are you blushing? Hello? We're like right beside the hottest thing on the planet. Admit it. You're in love with me. What? I don't love you. I love... <gasps> er, Kate! I meant I hate you. I know what you meant. And I must confess, at first, yes, my intentions were purely strategic. Can the confessing wait? Kind of on a schedule here, bro. That is no longer the case. Because you, you have stolen my heart. Oh, that is so beautiful. Even if it is, Heather. Our connection goes deeper than any game. Together, we can take over the world. Well, I suppose I might actually feel a, a little something. Mi amor. <laughs> Oh, come on, man. Things were going so well. Ugh. Now we have whatever this crap is. Like, what's she doing? Sucking on a jawbreaker or some shit? A little something called victory. So long, sucker. Heather quickly picks up the dummy and moves to throw it in, but she makes one major mistake. She wasn't prepared for the switchy summer, bitch! Switchy wins the million! Oh, fuck yeah! I win once again! The switchy summer never ends, bitch! Fuck you, Heather! Fuck you, Al! You don't have shit on me! Switch it! Actually, I didn't really win the million dollars. Heather throws in the dummy and is the actual righteous victor of the prize money. Look how beautiful it is! Oh, you didn't throw any pineapples in the volcano, did you? There are signs everywhere! Oh yeah, they really ruined the shot, so we put the human wall there. <laughs> Don't you know what happens when pineapples meet lava? Uh, -oh. uh, I don't know if that's scientifically accurate. Whoa, didn't see that one coming. <laughs> what the hell? You know, I'm gonna be honest. This scene is too much for me. Something about a relatively normal 16 or 17 year old kid being driven to complete insanity and falling into an active volcano is kind of, well, overkill. I guess I mean that figuratively though, because he somehow survives. Spoiler alert. It's made even worse when no one actually displays any real concern for him. Like, Guys, he's a human being with emotions and desires. A human being who, realistically, should be dead right now. But I guess he's made of titanium or something. I suppose a lot of people might be compelled to argue with me that this is all just a cartoon and I shouldn't take it too seriously. But honestly, I stand by my complaints here. I've connected with these characters, including Ezekiel, and seeing a kid as young as him go through what he did just isn't really funny to me. It's just creepy and off color. Like, I get that it's a reference to the Lord of the Rings, but that doesn't really change anything for me. It's not displayed as tragic, and Ezekiel is not portrayed as so evil that he deserves this kind of thing to happen to him. I remember seeing this crap as a kid and being genuinely unnerved. Where are his parents? What do they think? This show set a relatively grounded tone and sense of humor in its first two seasons, and suddenly upping the ante to the point where crap like this happens is just jarring and uncomfortable. 
Even when the show had its Looney Tunes style slapstick, there was an air of impermanence to it, and characters who exploded or fell long distance seemed to be okay after a good night's rest. But for Zeke, none of this ever happens. He reappears in later seasons with no signs of being able to ever talk or act normally again. I'm not saying I have anything against dark comedy, but this show has never really been a dark comedy. So for me, a scene like this falls super flat. But hey, for what it's worth, reading about the weird Ezekiel situation all those years back on the show's wiki is one of the main things that made me curious enough to watch the season in the first place. So, I mean, silver lining to every cloud, you know? The volcano erupts and our entire cast runs as fast as they can away from the destruction. As they run, they trample Alejandro, and right after, he's completely engulfed in the lava flow. God damn it. See you next season, I guess. Ah! Maybe with a whole new cast, because let's face it, these guys are probably going to melt. Until next time, I'm Chris McLean, and this has been Total Drama! Ah! That ending fucking sucked! Okay, well, maybe that's a bit of hyperbole. But I gotta say, the last minute of this episode is not exactly the show's best material. Besides the fact that too much happens in too little time, it's just, like, really unsatisfying. It just ends right there, like The Sopranos, but instead of being a really thought-provoking and challenging finale, it's just rushed and haphazardly thrown together. I feel like there's some sort of disconnect between me and the people who wrote this episode. One of my favorite things about the first two seasons finales is the conclusion aspect. Gwen and Owen come out of the experience more fully formed. Beth and Duncan have developed an unlikely friendship. Here, though, Heather wins the money. People cheer for like a second, but then the money is stolen and destroyed and the episode ends literally within a minute. And it's all kind of played off as a joke. But for me, that's not what I want. Compare this to the first two finales. The cheering, the awesome dialogue, the feelings of camaraderie. That's not what we get here, at all. It just comes off as tone deaf. The season had so much drama and stakes that they built up, but they blew it in the last inning, and that's what gets to me. Honestly, even with the weird Ezekiel crap, they really had the ingredients for the best episode of the show here. The way they escalated the conflict in the last few episodes was top notch, but they completely fucked it up. All that excitement built up for a climax that never comes. It's like if someone got you really hyped up for a fireworks show, only for the fireworks to all be duds. Or another analogy that I can't really go in depth on. And don't even get me started on how right after this, they ditch all of the original characters and create a whole new cast. For all we knew, this was the last hurrah. I remember being a kid and thinking they were never gonna have the original cast as contestants again. And this being our goodbye, yeah, not exactly to my liking. My best guess is that they were strapped for time. Every single episode has to be a certain length so they might have had to wrap up the ending as fast as they could. But if I could go back in time and give them advice, I would tell them to either cut down the Mario level scene or make it so that Alejandro beats Cody to Hawaii and there's no need for a tiebreaker. With the minutes saved, we could have likely had an ending that doesn't feel so rushed and ambivalent. But wait, you interject. You haven't brought up the post credit scene yet. And you're right, I have not. There's a post credit scene to this episode. And don't worry, there's no Samuel L. Jackson teasing any crossovers here, if you're worried about that. It's basically just an elaborate Star Wars reference where Alejandro is fitted into the drama machine. For some reason. I don't actually know why. Before I wrap things up, I should pay lip service to the alternate ending. Because, like all Total Drama finales, there is no canon winner. Depending on the part of the world you live in, the original broadcast of the show had one of two characters win the million. For example, Heather wins in countries like the United States and Australia, while Alejandro wins in Canada. And his ending is pretty interesting. In the ending, Heather still manages to kick Alejandro where it stings and send him down the mountain. However, she has a brain fart and accidentally throws Alejandro's dummy into the lava, meaning he wins the million. Also, instead of fighting Heather for the briefcase, Zeke and Chris have the little tug of war. Double also, Alejandro is burnt alive somewhere on the incline of the volcano instead of the beach. You know, when the volcano erupts and all the debris goes tumbling down, tumbling down, tumbling down. Yeah, that part. Also, because she didn't win, 
Heather swims off with the others instead of staying behind and asking about her money. <sighs> so that was Total Drama World Tour. Yeah, uh, this video was long. Well, you know, I've been complaining a lot today, and I think some people might be mad at me for that. So, I just want to make one thing crystal clear. Total Drama World Tour is a fantastic season, and I genuinely love it. Now, I know that comes off as a bit of a sudden change in pace, given I was just ripping into it for its lazy, rushed ending, but all of its weaknesses mean very little in the grand scheme of things when compared to its strengths. Sure. I think Gwunkin wasn't very well handled, and I think the ending was super unsatisfying, but those are only two small negative marks on an otherwise amazing record. I gotta tell you guys, writing this video was not easy, and one of the hardest parts was trying to decide what jokes in the show I would talk about. There were so many hilarious moments that I wanted to include but couldn't for time's sake, and leaving them out genuinely stunk. The comedic dialogue in this season is the cream of the crop for animation, and I really need to stress that to those of you who've never seen the season before. This video might be long, but it does not replace the pure hilarity that is the original material, and I urge all my viewers to watch the season if they haven't already. Characters like Heather, Owen, Sierra, and Noah never cease to make me laugh, and I would genuinely say that in terms of pure comedic value, Total Drama World Tour surpasses even the first season of the show. Yeah, it's that good. The show also feels so much larger than life here. I don't know if it's the fact that they're going around the world or something in the storyboards, but this season feels so epic. I mean, as I said in the finale review, the volcano scenes are badass up until the ending. Even though the whole premise of the show is just a teen reality drama, the sense of scale makes it feel like so much more. Alejandro really drives the season in such an interesting direction through his villainy, and I very much appreciate the show's intentions to make him seem as evil as possible. In Heather, too! Heather is turned into an unlikely heroine figure in this season, and it's so cool to see. She really earned her spot as a finalist, and it really rounds out an awesome arc that she's had from seasons 1 to 3. If you guys want more info on my opinion of the character's portrayals, feel free to check out the tier list video I am releasing along with this. Some people might complain about the season being paint by numbers, or some characters like DJ and Lindsay being flanderized, but honestly, none of that really got on my nerves. If there's one thing I think this season did really well, it's that its flaws are never really drawn out to the point where it really gets on your nerves. Even the Gwunkin stuff is surprisingly quick, only lasting a couple of episodes. The character arcs and plot points the show spends most of its time on are almost always ones that I adore, and nothing that bothers me overstays its welcome. There's a lot more of Heather and Alejandro constantly battling it out than there is Lindsay forgetting who Tyler is over and over again. I'll say that much. I know I might come off as a bit cynical and needlessly nitpicky when I review this show, but Really, the only reason I'm such a stickler is because I love it so much. It's kind of why I made these roast videos in the first place. Total Drama is an awesome show, but there were always weird things about it that I wanted to point out and discuss with others. If I didn't like this show, I would see no reason in making a video this long detailing all the things I dislike. I just wouldn't bother to talk about it, and the only reason I was so unsatisfied with the ending is that the stakes were raised so high and I was so engrossed with everything that came before. I really have to like you to write thousands of words criticizing you, is what I'm trying to say. When all said and done, Total Drama World Tour is a phenomenal season, and it really gives Island a good run for its money. I still would say I prefer Island due to it being more multifaceted, but god damn is it a close match. Its characters, comedy, and sense of scale make it so memorable and I will forever cherish it because of that. It's a season I've loved since before I was in middle school, and will almost certainly continue to love for the rest of my life. Oh yeah, and the music is pretty good too. I'm feeling a light to decent eight. Thank you to everyone who helped me take on this massive project. It's kind of crazy to think about how grand the island video felt when I first made it. Compared to this, the island video was nothing. I want to thank my animator Shallot Hair, my voice guy Jocoto, all my patrons, and I want to thank you, yes, you, for watching this. The fact that I can essentially talk about this 12-year-old TV show 
and somehow bring so much joy and entertainment to so many people is a dream come true, and I can't even put into words how blessed I feel. I originally made the island video because I liked the show and thought making a video that long would be a funny one-time gimmick, but things are very different now, and it's all thanks to you guys. I know I joke about the comments sometimes, but I don't want to lose sight of how genuinely amazing it is that I've created a series that has so many people constantly asking for more. That's a luxury a lot of creators don't have, and I can't express how grateful I am. Making these videos has genuinely changed my life, and I have you guys to thank for it. So once again, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all around.